everyone. I'd like to call the uh, February 21st board meeting to order, please. Um, Kevin is on vacation. Pat is on vacation, so I'm acting chair today. Um, first order on the agenda is to approve January 17, 2018 meeting. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Abstain? January 17th, meeting is passed. The second item on the agenda is going to be public comment. Does everyone have... Can I ask a couple of questions? Absolutely. I'm not sure if it just got overlooked, but I didn't get a... Maybe I just didn't get it. I didn't get a draft last week's minutes email for the board. Did we? I think it should have been. I apologize, but I can give one to you right now. Well, I, ha I, I read it on the, on the department's website, but normally we get a draft the board, mm -hmm. and I didn't see it. So I did not receive one as well. Okay. okay. You knew well, so I'm going to cut you some yeah. black. <laughs> 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 Can I do the same to me? <laughs> Any other questions or discussion? Okay, so we're going to do public comment. Has everyone had a chance to sign up that wanted to speak? Can we do a two minute public comment to mid first since this is a board working meeting and not a, not a public hearing? Okay, so um, we have Lindsay Beal. Are you speaking in public comment also? No. Okay. Renee Callahan? No, I, I crossed it out. So I don't want to speak. Troy Kilburn? Hello. I would normally speak, but uh, I'm so used to not being able to, <laughs> I didn't realize that we can do that now. I think it's a good change. Okay. Dottie Blue? Dottie Blue? Yeah, that'd be me. Um, I went on a lifetime, and I guess we're here tonight because we're hearing there's a proposal that's going to come up in front of us uh, to either end moose hunting or severely cut it back. And I think my guides would agree with us that we spent hundreds of hours in the summer in the woods. I think you've done an outstanding job with the moose herd. You've knocked the population down enough that what we're seeing is as guides and hunters, the ticks are dying, dying, dying. They're leaving. There's no feed. And I don't think it would be wise to cancel that and to end that. Because all we're going to do is go back into a fight, having to bring all that back up again, go through legislation and try and put a moose season back on the board. Cuts, maybe, but I don't think it would be wise to abolish it and end it. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Andrews? Two minutes, right? Yes. So this has to, uh, in part with ticks, this gentleman mentioned, um, I, I have to say that I've found literature um, throughout New England that actually says that the moose die-offs related to the uh, blood meals of the ticks um, contradicts what you think. But first of all, I want to start by saying that last week in the Bennington Banner, Commissioner Porter was quoted as saying that we, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, don't usually make decisions that are not based on science, which is comforting. The Scram Center, which is based in Bennington, Vermont, and New York, which has uh, been set up specifically for the purpose of studying Lyme disease, was quoted in 2017 as saying that we have an epidemic out of control discussing Lyme disease. Over half of all of the mice that were tested, tested positive for Lyme disease. I think that's important to bring into account because of the fact that our number one predator in the wild that's helping us fight Lyme disease are foxes. There's no reason to consider, to consider not putting a moratorium on foxes. Uh, it's predicted, according to Felicia Keesing, who's the environmental ecology expert at Bard College out of New York, that 2017-2018, record years, she was right about 2017. The number one reason that we had a record year for Lyme disease based in 2017 was because, her quote, high mouse populations. Illinois Department of Natural Resources, over 60% of a fox diet is mice. So if you take into account of the fact that red fox average lifespan is three years and they eat upwards of 5,000 mice a year, 
That means that in the course of one fox's wild life in the state of Vermont, over half of the ticks they eat have Lyme disease. That means they've consumed 15,000 mice, half of which have Lyme disease. If anybody in this room knows anybody or has a family member that has Lyme disease, it's a vicious battle. I think the only That's helper that we have in the wild is coyotes and foxes. Thank you me. really should take into consideration what all the monsters want, not just the trappers. Thank you. Pat Rada. <coughs> Hold on a second. <coughs> I am here also about the potential that there's a moose uh, proposal to get shot down for the moose hunt. And to be, in all fairness, I guide for moose, but I do know one thing, and that is we attended the, me the meeting at the board that the game department had a month ago. And at that time, they were cautiously optimistic with the way things are going. We have an ongoing moose collaring study of which we do not have any data coming back yet on that. I would suggest that we do as the state was saying and cautiously, optimistically, we go forward with the moose hunt. If we wish to choose to lower permits, that's fine. We can do that, but one of the best methods that we have found and that other states have found to knocking down this tick problem is by actually, and it goes against all common sense, to have a thinner population rather than a thicker one where the ticks can be spread from one to the other. And the last I knew, I have not seen in the big woods a fox. I don't know where they're going to be eating the mice. I can tell you that I don't see them there. I don't see the tracks. Which is why I think there's I don't believe it's your two minutes. Excuse me, we're not bantering back and forth, please. Anyways, I do believe that should continue. I don't believe a moratorium would be in the greatest sense. And that we should just stay the course and follow scientific methods, Thank not you. emotional. Thank you. Anyone else that didn't sign up? Okay, well, thank you for your time. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Are you at the end of the public comment? I just walked in, I'm sorry. Yes, if you'd like to. I do, I just have a quick statement. Your name, please? Um, my name is Kristen Cameron. Kristen Cameron. And so, um, I'm just, I just wanted to say that I'm concerned about our depleted moose populations and I would like to urge the board to stop the moose hunt and give them a chance to recover if it's hopefully not already too late. For my read of the moose proposal, which unfortunately I got a little late, um, <clears throat> it seems like there's an unwarranted intention that's placed on opportunities to hunt and the 12,000 pounds of meat that would be pr provided. Um, and I also see that there's like a clear undercurrent to me about uh, wishful thinking and hoping that 14 permits aren't going to um, impact the species. And I just wonder, do you really want to make matters worse by allowing people to kill the strongest herd, which um, I understand is often what happens. And I urge you to err on the side of caution um, and take, just take a break from, from issuing loose permits this year. However, I'm realistic, and I know a hiatus is probably fairly unlikely with this board um, because of ongoing prioritization of hunting and pacifying <clears throat> hunters' fears and desires. So I'd like to offer another suggestion. And my suggestion is that if the board insists on a 2018 moose hunt, then I ask you at least to count any wounded moose toward the bag limit. Um, so any moose that a hunter shoots but fails to recover um, would count. Uh, they do this in other states, I'm told by Mark Scott, and uh, this just seems like one small step that, that can ensure that only the number of moose that the board decides is acceptable to kill are the only ones that are killed by a bullet or an arrow. And moose just are a really important and really iconic animal in this state, and uh, they're also an economic driver. 
of uh, wildlife Thank you. watchers. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Okay. Thank everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. The third item on our agenda is going to be on the Lyme disease um, petition. So, Ms. Beal, if you'd like to present your petition, you have 10 minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay and I live in the Loops of Memorial County. And to make a long story short, could you speak up just a bit? Myself and my husband um, spent a great deal outside as well in the woods. Um, on the mountains and whatnot, and especially in warmer months, we have been finding a, a large increase in the amount of tips um, that we find ourselves. We have two dogs, friends, family, it's pretty well known in the state. And that prompted myself to do research and why is there a rise in the tick population, why is there a large amount of Lyme disease cases, and how can we better protect ourselves, and that is why I'm, I'm here today. Based upon my research of Vermont's rapidly rising Lyme disease cases and other tick-borne diseases and new research regarding the increase of mice population and activity in connection to the decrease of key rodent predators such as foxes, I have submitted a petition to the board requesting a moratorium on the recreational and commercial trapping and hunting of foxes to help combat Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. This proposal will not impact rights to kill foxes in defense of your property. Tick and Lyme disease is an enormous health, um, public health concern that must be addressed immediately. An efficient and cost-effective solution is to work with Mother Nature rather than against it, and that means allowing foxes to prey on white-footed mice who infect the majority of ticks that feed on them. Supported by evidence that I um, had provided to the board, um, I do have hard copies to me if you'd like to look at. Further, this proposal does have the strong potential to reduce human and animal exposure to diseases contracted by ticks who feed, once again, heavily in white-footed mice who are a major host. Along with the petition, I, I did submit um, three letters of support from people who suffer from Lyme disease, and as it was a mentioned it can be incredibly um, harmful and, and, and change their lifestyles and um, and also I do have a list of over um, 800 um, Vermont signatures that do support this petition um, and their comments and just some facts to kind of back up everything I'm saying. Um, Lyme disease has spread at an alarming rate in our state. According to the Vermont Department of Health in 2015, Vermont had the highest rate of reported Lyme disease cases in the United States. 763 confirmed cases of Lyme disease were accounted for in 2016. That was confirmed cases reported by the Tick-Borne Disease Program in Vermont. In 2017, Vermont was one of the top two states with the highest instances of Lyme disease. In March of this past year, it was reported that over 50% of ticks surveyed in Vermont tested positive for Lyme disease. According to another study by the Infectious Disease Department at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, Upwards of 63% of ticks were infected statewide with at least one tick-borne disease and some carrying two at a time. Wildlife specialists suggest there is evidence that there is a link between the increase of mice populations and their activity and the decline of predators that hunt mice, especially foxes. <clears throat> Although ticks can get infected with Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases from other animals, the bulk and is being more and more found in um, proved to back it up are infected not by deer, but in fact by mice. In fact, mice infect up to 95% of ticks that feed on them and are responsible for infecting the majority of ticks carrying Lyme disease in the Northeast. And everything I'm saying, I do have notes of where I found the sources, so if you're questioning where I found it. Um, worried me mice tend to stay in hiding and wander less when there is a larger presence of predators such as foxes. When mice roam less, it means there's a less likelihood to become a host for ticks. Predators can drastically number, lower the number of ticks feeding on mice, which calls for the much deserved appreciation and protection of the species, in particular foxes in this case. In addition to these facts, this petition is one of the most safe, sensible, and effective policies that can be adopted for several more reasons. 
there would be no use of harmful chemicals. Um, a win-win for public safety and the environment. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, but to sum it up, um, for example, the executive director of Beyond Pesticides, um, that tick repelling chemicals can cause acute and chronic health problems, um, kill bees, harm wildlife in many ways I can't go into, such as um, our own pets and fish and our waterways. They can also damage surface water and groundwater. We would be allowing Mother Nature to create healthy ecosystems by balancing predator to prey numbers, which is vital for all animals and their habitat. Foxes are a key species to help maintain a healthy ecosystem by managing prey population, which means their presence is much more valuable alive than dead. The Vermont Fish and Wildlife has incomplete and poor data on the number of foxes who are hunted or trapped each year. In fact, I worked with a statistician who looked over the fur bearers' population trends and estimates that they personally sent to me, and they concluded that the gray fox population is actually on the decline, which is, of course, very concerning. Essentially, the population data that I was sent provided no biological insight to game managers for making wildlife management decisions and regulations. Also, foxes killed under Vermont's nuisance wildlife permission provision go entirely unreported, and those numbers could be significant. Foxes already face numerous threats, um, so list a few um, human caused mortalities to cars, domestic dogs. Um, they also fishers, eagles who prey on fox kits. It does not make sense to add another threat to the fox population. In addition, our planet, as we can see every day, is rapidly changing habitat loss, warmer temperatures, unpredictable weather patterns, less food sources. And in support of this petition was a man named Dr. Sipas, who has a PhD in wildlife and fisheries and a professor of um, wildlife ecology. And his thoughts um, include um, a different voice, viewpoint in regards to the validity of current scientific data on harvesting animals and the sustainability um, yes, that there's most likely that um, trapping will not um, will not ruin the survival of um, the species. Um, however, all the information that we have in this time is uh, about the effects of past animal behaviors and the effects of humankind on wildlife is based on the past 150 plus years of evidence. The planet was very, very different in the past, even 15 years ago. Uh, and I've heard more and more times that, oh, 1800s, 1900s, oh, 40 years ago, a lot of that stuff is not relevant today and it is um, poor data to rely on. Um, policies of any kind, including trapping and hunting policies, cannot be based strictly on evidence gathered from decades past because that da data quite simply is becoming irrelevant. For example, killing 100 foxes today does not have the same impact as killing 100 foxes 50 years ago, primarily because Regeneration possibilities, possibilities are now clouded and uncertain. Overall intentions, such as culling the deer population, which I know is kind of a, a big one that's been um, discussed, uh, coating lawns or using body sprays that contain tick killing pesticides have made minimal differences in lessening the spread of ticks and ultimately ends up being a short term solution. Interventions like protecting foxes or factoring the habitat needs of particular predators into land use decisions to advance their population is getting to the root of the problem as opposed to quick fixes, which I feel happens a lot. <clears throat> Halting the sport killing of foxes may have tremendous and life-saving results for the health and safety of Vermont residents. Um, I personally have known uh, pets. My dog got contracted with Lyme disease and it was kind of nasty for a while. And I personally know people who have con contracted Lyme disease and um, it can be um, incredibly debilitating. Recreation killing of foxes that serve less than 1% in the state must not take priority over the health and interests of the general public. Taking a modest evidence-based step, I must stress evidence-based step to assist our state in arresting the rapidly rising rate of tick-borne disease is well worth the time and effort of the board. Um, and I just, am I allowed to touch base on something else that publicly? You have one minute. Um, I, I know it was mentioned that you don't see foxes in the wild. Well, that should be a, an immediate red flag that, wow, these predators are, their numbers, not only maybe for Lyme disease, but should be able to 
um, get their populations back to a healthier um, number. So that's kind of an immediate red flag uh, for me that their their populations are not really healthy. If you're out there for hundreds of hours and not seeing them, um, that's not a, a good sign. So um, thank you. That's it. Thank you. So where would you like to proceed with this? So the question, I think, for the board is whether they want to take this petition up at this point or or table it for a period of time when we are looking at uh, hunting or trapping regulations related to foxes. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing that I would add is um, you have an awful lot of information um, that, that Ms. Bio put before you uh, to do that. What we've been wanting to do, and the board's had that interest, is to come in and give a, give a formal scientific presentation on the whole issue of Lyme disease. Um, how it relates to ecosystem health, exotics, predator-prey relationships. Uh, you know, so you know we've been wanting to do that for some time. So what I'd ask the board, um, regardless of what you want to do with the petition, that I think we'd like to probably come back at some point this calendar year. I hate to put a date on it just because of um, so many things staff are dealing with. But perhaps I'm thinking of late summer, um, early fall, and have my staff give a presentation on um, ticks. Lyme disease, white-tailed deer, white-footed ice, predators, ecosystem health, exotics, the whole, the whole picture to do that. Um, we did a real you know, quick look at the petition, obviously, and, and you know, it's complex. Um, I think you're hearing lots of different sound bites from scientific communities out there, and I'd, I'd rather us give a thorough scientific response um, to the board, just so you're educated, because the board's asked for this. And if there's anything that we heard the last three uh, public meetings we had on moose was, there's a lot of questions, a lot of human fear, a lot of misunderstanding about ticks. I mean, people don't even know that there's a trade of moose tick, you know, winter tick and deer tick. So, you know, we'd like to, like to have that discussion and try to educate the board a little bit about that later on, um, regardless of what you do you know, on this, this, okay. this petition. So, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'd like to make a motion that we table it until at such time that the department comes back with a proposal for the board to look at. Anyone second? I'll second. Any discussion? I just have one question. First word on the petition moratorium. Are we being asked to stop it indefinitely no. or for a certain time period? Are you asking me? Yeah, you're the one. Moratorium does not mean definitely. Um, it means basically, yes, you stop it, and then maybe you have, uh, I don't have the exact definition, but probably a good safe, um, I'm assuming at least three to five years to get a, in order to get a really good sense um, and collect data in order to see, is this effective? Um, is it working? Um, so I would have to have a specific and reasonable you can't just do it for two weeks and expect to get back really um, thorough and, and, and good research from it. So it's it's not a definitely, but it would. Hope, I mean, ultimately, it would be preferable, but um, it is not indefinite. Question: um, If you mark, you might be coming up with this. Is um, how are the red fox numbers, and do they not compete with coyotes for the same uh, resources? So I'm not sure people are the resources, but <coughs> coyotes can influence red fox numbers. So I higher, actually higher, prey on them, higher coyote numbers in some locales negative, could affect negative red fox. You know, they'll tend to cohabit in the same area, although you'll find from the research will tell you that the fox will try to avoid um, the coyotes usually. And it gets more critical, resources are limited. But we're not worried at all about red fox numbers or population size and state of mind. We feel that you know, we deal with a, with a limited harvest, but they're doing well statewide. Thank you. Where the habitats are. Right. I guess I would ask Mark or Cedric to correct me if I'm wrong, but my observations are down that since coyotes came and established themselves in just about every bit of suitable habitat in Vermont, uh, fox numbers and bobcat numbers have uh, been seriously diminished. The other thing I've noticed in recent years, I spend a lot of time in the woods and I have quite a few trail cameras in the woods. I get more fox pictures and see, I have fox tracks in my yard every day when there's snow that can 
indicate a fresh track. Uh, I have more fox pictures than anything else on my trail cameras. They're the pattern I've seen from, I usually know of about four or five active dens each spring. Uh, foxes have chosen, I think they've adapted uh, to the presence of coyotes so that now they're denning quite often. The dens I've known about, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about probably four or five a year for the last several years, are close proximity to humans within 300 feet of houses, camps, outbuildings. I know I always used to read that they'll den within 300 feet of water. Well, that's oftentimes the case too. They're near brooks or around the lakes where I live. But uh, I think the main limiting factor is the presence of coyotes on the landscape, and foxes are somewhat marginalized by that. Uh, I look at what little hunting and trapping of foxes is done, probably in areas where there is fairly good fox populations, are a good control factor as far as preventing uh, rabies, mange, and di distemper to manage those populations where there may be you know, not enough coyotes to limit the fox population, but um, I think there's their range has been marginalized by coyotes, and they'd rather deal with the stresses of living close to in proximity to humans instead of living in close proximity to coyotes from just the patterns that I've noticed. Craig, I'm not going to respond and I'll do technical questions on that. I think that's why we'd rather come back at a later time. Um, there's, <laughs> it's a pretty complex situation in, in research. You know, we've done a little bit in Vermont back in the, the 90s, 80s and 90s, but um, a little bit limited. But people have looked at all these different in, interrelationships and it's tied in with habitat. And all of us know how really successional habitat is. Young forests have declined here in the state. That's a factor. Um, as well, but um, you know, as far as we're concerned, you know, foxes, bobcat, coyotes are all living on the landscape we have in Vermont, and statewide and healthy. So, uh, but we'll, we'll talk to that point at a later point to the board. Yeah, I just like to add. I think that's kind of like <clears throat> they're being more displaced by coyotes than I think hindered by them per se. But what, the other thing I'd like to add to, I mean, I, the reason I, I uh, motioned the table is, is I just don't feel personally that we've got enough data from the department to make any you know, correct decisions. And I just need, like to see more before that happens. Mark, I was just going to follow up to Craig's comments and just to the, the displacement. If there's any way you can include uh, when, on the line piece, uh, <laughs> locations. Uh, I know CDC has a map out there, um, kind of where the, the uh, cases are popping up. That may be helpful as well. Okay. Relative to sure. rural. Yep. Bush. These questions are helpful. So since we get the presentation together, I mean, we've got them recorded, and what I may do is, is share those back with you too, because it may generate some other questions you may have for our staff to look at. Do you have a time frame as to when you will get back with the board? Yeah, I mean, you know, every time I said that, I got in trouble, but I did say late, late summer. <laughs> like, we've been wanting to do this for some time. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a big issue. I think we all get affected. It, it even affects hunters out there all the time. Uh, you know, so, yeah. That's all reasonable. Mm -hmm. I hate to pin the exact month because uh, if anything I found is things can pop up. Well, you were unexpectedly. So. You did better than that, Mark. You didn't say which summer. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the last time I said we were going to do a three-year plan to uh, yeah. board member Mr. Gallo? He still holds me. I think like that was three commissioners. <laughs> uh, any other? Do we have any data available, say, from the um, Vermont Trappers Association fur auctions on how many fox? Helps. Sure, we'll, we'll pull yeah. together. Yeah. But know if they're not, yeah. like some of the animals that have to be reported to a warden or tagged, or we'll, we'll pull together that. everything we have from the surveys and from other For sources. Record, you yeah. have that. I think I've seen yeah. figures on like how many fox pelts were 
for sale at the auction or maybe Bill could add to that or something, but I would think that information, information would be, that. it just seems to me that the, the annual take on foxes is not having a detrimental effect on the numbers. The, the problem with the fur auction is they're not guaranteed that they're taken that year. A lot of times a trapper, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, will hold the, the, the pelts until the prices change. So, you know, you might have a huge uptake, but it might be because the, the fur prices are doing really well. I would agree with you on uh, raccoons and mink and probably muskrats. But I think most everybody gets rid of their foxes and coyotes. Okay. Anyway, we'll pull together whatever we've got. So if anybody has any other questions you'd like for Mark to kind of uh, investigate, uh, we'll make up a couple <coughs> questions. So we have um, a motion on the floor right now to table the petition. I'm going to kind of hold Mark by the fire, and I'd like it by uh, the September meeting. Okay. Yep. So I'd like to have the presentation um, by the September meeting. So that way there's ample time, it's about six months, um, and get everything up and running. So again, there's a, a motion, and we have a second. Any other discussions? Any other questions? Oh, am I, am I allowed to No, you're not. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do this as a show of hands. So. Anyone, everyone, whoever is in action, can go around, around. In agreement to table the petition to the September meeting. David? Aye. Aye. No? Uh, no. I would rather take no action. I believe that this, I think this is unwarranted. Aye. Yes. 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 Uh, I'm with Craig. No. Yes. No. So the yeses have it? Three, yes. yep, that's just how it looks like three no's and one, two, three, eight. Okay, so it's going to be table until the September 8th. Eight to table, is it? Is that? Yeah. Pardon? What was that again? Was it eight to table? Eight, eight, eight three. three, yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Adam, you're up. So the fourth agenda is 15. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, for folks that don't know, I'm Adam Miller. I'm the Fish Culture Operations Manager for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. I receive the Fish Hatchery and Fish Health Program. And I'm here tonight to talk to you, the uh, folks on the board remember, uh, early on when we were going through the Big Fish Regulations Review Framework and talking about it, we did a hot dog exercise and we asked board members to provide some feedback on some educational topics that we could come back to the board and talk about um, with regards to big fish. One of the things that rose to the top of the list was geographic areas of risk. We addressed that in our last board meeting. And the next thing that came up on the list as far as popularity was a comprehensive evaluation of fish pathogens and aquatic nuisance species. So, hoping to make this uh, a relatively quick and painless uh, meeting for all of you. I'll set my timer so we make sure that we're not going to go over time. Um, can, can people see that okay? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Ooh. Adam, you will also email us with. Yes. Yep, I, I already emailed Will and Will will provide that to the rest of the floor. So, uh, just to kind of recap where we've left off before, the overall goal of the Vermont Bait Fish Regulations Review Team is to review the current Vermont Bait Fish Regulations with a very strong likelihood of coming back to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board with uh, a revised proposal in the future to regulate bait fish in a manner that's in the best interest of the public, but still provides an adequate level of protection to Vermont's fisheries resources. So that is kind of our ethos as we go through all of this. And I have a number of purposes for tonight's meeting. The first purpose is just to talk about work done to date regarding uh, fish pathogens and 
Many folks have probably heard of the fish pathogen VHS. It's uh, an acronym for viral hemorrhagic septicemia. It's a pretty nasty fish pathogen, so not just looking at VHS, but fish pathogens in general in the Northeast. Additionally, we wanted to talk about research done to date uh, regarding aquatic nuisance species. We love acronyms in state government, so ANS is what I put on here. And also to discuss a recent enforcement action that was taken. Um, I don't know if, if everyone on the board has seen there was a recent enforcement action that was taken regarding the presence of a non-native fish species that showed up in a uh, uh, batch of imported fathead minnows from Arkansas. And then finally, just to gather feedback from the board, any kind of questions or, or concerns you have as we're going through this process, um, and really just kind of hear from you as to what, what you're looking at, what you think we're going to focus more on, and what we need to include in our framework. So without further ado, we'll hop into fish pathogens. And I just wanted to kind of put up, there are a number of fish pathogens that are out there in the environment. Um, some of them are like the equivalent of the common cold. Others of them are, are not the common cold. They're a lot more serious. Um, so we kind of lumped uh, lump these, uh, the serious fish pathogens into a number of different categories. There's emergency fish pathogens, which aren't currently located in the Northeast. I'm, I'm kind of backing out of Vermont into the Northeast in general. <laughs> So these are things that haven't been found in the Northeast yet, and they have a high potential for causing massive die-offs of fish. There's limited AFAT pathogens, which might have been detected in some sub-basins of, uh, of the Northeast. However, they can have adverse effects on you know, hatchery and wild stocks of fish, which include epizootic events that can cause massive mortalities. Limited B pathogens, which have been detected in specific areas of the Northeast, but whose range is kind of geographically limited or is undetermined. And we still feel that these fish pathogens are dangerous enough that we need to take efforts to you know, reduce and restrict the movement and you know, definitely keep the spread from, from going out. And then there's restricted fish pathogens. And these are pathogens that have the potential to cause epizootics under very specific circumstances. And some of these things we, we don't necessarily know everything about. So, this is kind of like another realm of, of pathogens that are out there. So as far as those different pathogen categories, you can see this is something that was pulled out of guidance from the Northeast Fish Health Committee, which is a group that Vermont belongs to, um, and a number of other state and federal fish and wildlife organizations have kind of worked to kind of work up these different diseases. Um, you've got your emergency pathogens, the really heavy hitters, the limited A pathogens, kind of the next step down limited B and restricted. And these are still pathogens that we're concerned about. There are other below the restricted that not necessarily is concerned about. So we don't have any emergency pathogens that have shown up in Vermont, and we're, we're happy about that. As far as things go for limited A pathogens, we do have a history of having whirling disease. Uh, many folks have probably fished the Batten Kill River before. The Batten Kill River continually tests positive for whirling disease. We actually believe that that was brought in to the state of Vermont through a fish stocking uh, from New York State DEC that ended up uh, fish moving into, into Vermont waters that have growing disease. As far as limited bee pathogens go, we have a number of different limited bee pathogens. Infectious pancreatic necrosis was around, it was a long time ago that we detected that. We haven't detected it recently. Large milk bass virus, uh, bacterial kidney disease, and furunculosis. Uh, those are some of the fish pathogens that we've seen on the limited bee. And then a few of the restricted fish pathogens, Lake Trout Herpes Virus and Lake Champlain, uh, Isosid Lymphosarcoma, it's like a, a Northern Pike Herpes Virus. Some folks might have seen that in uh, Lake Champlain, or in Lake Champlain, Northern Pike. And then Heterosporus has been detected in Yellow Perch in Lake Champlain as well. So, a million dollar question is, is there a threat of moving fish pathogens by moving fish. So here's just some examples, and I'm giving these examples from trout, not necessarily from bait fish, and a lot of the reason we're giving that perspective from trout is because there's just been a lot more research that's been done with trout and trout diseases. You know, trout aquaculture has been going on for a long time, so they've been able to study and get a good recording of what happens with these diseases. 
And Tara Grenmouth was actually only president in, I or president in Idaho in the 1950s. Um, now it's actually spread worldwide. So we're talking in a, in a relatively short period of time, there is a fish disease that had, you know, essentially through the movement of fish, the culture practices, looming around the world has kind of moved and is, is all throughout the, the Northeast and I guess beyond just this continent. Also, whirling disease showed up in the Northeast and a good example of that is just uh, brown trout were originally, um, came from Europe, many folks know that brown trout came from Europe. And through the fish culture program, for example, in Pennsylvania, they ended up transferring fish to Connecticut and Connecticut actually um, traced that disease of whirling disease that showed up in their fish hatcheries to fish that were transferred from Pennsylvania. And then I also mentioned the New York stocking of fish into the Battenkill River um, that had whirling disease. Adam, can I ask a question? Sure. About whirling disease, can you just give the definition of what impact it has on a fish? Sure. So um, there, there's kind of two things that can happen. One is they can actually die. Um, and then the other is they can become carriers and spread the disease. Um, I would actually defer to Tom Jones, who's kind of our fish pathologist, to kind of talk about, maybe Tom, you could talk about the impacts of whirling disease. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from the concept of whirling disease, um, in the Northeast, uh, there's been a lot of reports in states like Pennsylvania and New York as whirling disease is, is present in quite a few waters, and it's not <coughs> like major impacts like it is in some of the western states like Montana and Idaho. So it could be there in very, very low stages, chronic, and then, but it could be just the opposite of the conditions are right, you know, and cause some fairly substantial mortality in those populations. So I'd say like, a, like low severity, high severity. Um, I don't know the exact reason, and I'm not sure the researchers know the exact reason on why it's not causing um, real critical mortality in the northeast states like it has in the, in the western states. So then, kind of how does this relate back to bait fish? And really, um, the interesting thing is just we already know through the movement of fish and trout that are a pretty heavily researched species that that movement of disease can happen through just transferring of fish. Um, when it comes to bait fish, there are a number of pathogens that are specific to bait fish and can have you know, serious impacts to the fish populations that um, not only include minnows, but also can include you know, whatever fish prey on those minnows. So it's interesting, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that, that I'll admit like the scientific world just hasn't caught up with all the research out there as far as these new fish pathogens that are showing up in bait fish, which is, you know, a risk. So one of the things we've talked about, and I think it's really, we've got a lot of great feedback through our public discussion sessions on bait fish, is just this idea of the movement of water. Is, it's not just bait, but it's the movement of water that's also a concern. Um, Tim had an excellent, uh, example the other day when we had our bait fish meeting where you can essentially put on a white t-shirt and say your t-shirt is certified clean but then if you go and you roll in a mud puddle you're probably not going to go hop into your bed but even though you had a certified t-shirt on then because you've been in contact with other things in the environment doesn't necessarily mean that it's certified later so this idea of moving of water and how it how it stands for concerns mud puddle yeah. I think Tim, Tim had a little bit... There's a construction term. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea that many of these, these viruses, these parasites, um, these zebra mussel villagers and things like that, they're microscopic and they can be in the water. And it's not necessarily something someone can just go look and be like, yep, I definitely know that there's zebra mussels here. We do know that VHS is still a concern. It's a, it's a cold water loving virus usually likes to strike in the spring when water temperatures are nice and cold. Death usually occurs uh, from VHS, um, just from hemorrhaging. And basically, the fish hemorrhages so much and uh, the body begins to shut down, the organs begin to shut down. And there is no successful treatment. It's not like we can chemically treat these fish for any kind of, uh, you know, we can't, we can't give them a medicine that will fix them. Over 60 different fish species are known to be infected by VHS. What's interesting is it doesn't just include bait fish, it also includes some invertebrates like crayfish and leeches and things like that. 
emerald shiners, and this is where kind of bait fish come into play. Emerald shiners, which many folks know are a very popular bait fish species, have been implicated as a major carrier of VHS. And then the interesting thing is when VHS doesn't necessarily kill a fish, we talked about this with like whirling disease, if something doesn't necessarily get killed, it doesn't mean that they don't have the virus. They can actually be a carrier for the virus and then shed that into the water or pass that on to other fish. One of the things that's particularly alarming to me is there's some research going on out of Cornell University. Uh, the researcher's name is Rod Getchell. And his research is actually showing that round gobies have a very high prevalence of, uh, of holding the, the VHS virus. Um, so they might not necessarily die, but they can harbor VHS in them. And what's particularly alarming when you think about that is round goby haven't necessarily shown up in Lake Champlain. However, they're actively moving through the New York Canal system, and we know that you know Champlain is connected through the canal system right now. That you know gobies are kind of invading all these different areas, and it's just something I feel like we definitely need to keep a finger on the pulse on if if they are truly you know, this harbor, harboring species of, of VHS. So I wanted to just kind of go through and, and just take the, a case example of, of, of VHS and kind of where we stand and where things kind of started out and have moved through the, through, through the Northeast and the Great Lakes. And I'm not going to go into, like, we won't go into a ton of detail on this, but basically uh, starting in April 2005, there was you know, tens of thousands of fish that ended up dying in Lake Ontario. Shortly thereafter, there was a detection in Lake St. Clair in Michigan. Then, uh, within, I guess, just within a year, um, VHS was detected in the St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario, and Lake Erie. It included tens of thousands of dead fish. Also, things like musky, you know, 40, 50 plus inch musky were washing up dead on the shores in the St. Lawrence River. So, definitely a concern. This is really interesting Kinesis Lake. Several hundred walleye died there. And initially, you kind of think of VHS as this is like a Great Lakes problem, right? But Kinesis Lake, within just, just over one year, was a lake that is still hydrologically connected to the Great Lakes, but it definitely wasn't like a Great Lake that was actually showing mortality. <coughs> In September 2006, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie had an 11, you know, 11 additional species that contracted VHS. Shortly thereafter, Lake Huron. Then you have Lake Michigan. This is really interesting. Bud Lake actually ended up contracting VHS. And the interesting part about Bud Lake is actually the fact that Bud Lake is hydrologically disconnected from the Great Lakes. So this idea of the pathogen moving through the water to actually get into that water body, it, it wasn't there. There wasn't that connection. And actually what was implicated at that time was actually emerald shiners being brought over from the Great Lakes and used as bait in Bud Lake. Uh, Lake Butte de Moore and uh, Lake Winnebago. And, and, and right now, just to give us a snapshot, we started out in 2005. So we're seeing a lot of these happen. I mean, we're just talking in two years time, there's all these water bodies. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles this pathogen has been popping up and fish species have been affected. Skinny alleys. We started seeing it in the Seneca and Cayuga Canal, Water Salmon River. There's also a farm pond in Niagara County, New York. Ontario, new areas of Michigan, place in Ohio, Lake Superior, so now all Great Lakes are now infected with the virus. <coughs> so we moved on a little bit more, we're in January of 2010. Skip forward, four years actually, there wasn't a, a significant detection. Uh, the Root River in Wisconsin <coughs> ended up showing up positive. Cayuga Lake and Lake St. Clair. And that was the recent, that was the most recent. So just an idea, to give you an idea of the, the massive spread that can happen, and we're talking all this in a window from 2005 to 2017, that we had a spread of VHS. 
One of the things that's interesting, and we can't necessarily make some sort of assumption that it's causation, but you can see here, this is just a graph of the new, of the new waters that were infected by VHS on a yearly basis. And one of the interesting things to just take a look at is these are when the implementation of bait fish regulations started becoming you know, promulgated in different areas. So. So it's just something interesting. I mean, like I said, we can't necessarily say that, that this is a causation and this is definitely has affixed everything, and that's why there's no detections. Um, but it's just some interesting data to take a look at. So I also wanted to talk about the evaluation of aquatic nuisance species that are in the Northeast. We know that you know through our research done to date, <coughs> ANS is definitely a real threat. There's impacts to fisheries resources, there's impacts to recreation, there's a definite diminished economic return that's out there, and then there's also human health concerns. Anyone who stepped on or slipped on and cut themselves on zebra mussels knows that for sure. There are many fish pathogens and aquatic nuisance species inside and outside of Vermont. Some of the uh, imminent threats out there are around Gobi. Uh, New Zealand mud snails are all outside of Vermont. But we also still do have aquatic nuisance species that are present that are already in Vermont. Alewife zebra mussels, Asian clam, spiny water flea. And I know we talked about this earlier when we talked about geographic zonation approaches, but um, Champlain is definitely our highest risk vector. There's already approximately 50 aquatic invasive species that are present, and it's hydrologically connected with waters that you know, have different aquatic nuisance species and fish pathogens out there. That said, there are other risk vectors out there in Vermont. It's not just Lake Champlain. There's Lake Bavazine as an example, Lake St. Catherine, Lake Carmi. So this is a, a map I wanted to share with everyone. This is the Vermont DEC Aquatic Nuisance Species Map. You'll see there there's a number of water bodies and, and rivers and streams. The ones that are in red are actually some sort of a positive detection of an aquatic nuisance species. Ones in green are, are, just please disregard that, it's just the ones in red. So just some key notes to, to look at. Uh, presence of alewife uh, have been noted in Lake Champlain, Lake Carmine, which is a recent detection at Lake St. Catherine. Zebra mussels have shown up in Lake Champlain, Lake Bombazine, Asian clams in Lake Bombazine, and spiny water flea has been in Lake Champlain. So, some of the imminent threats that are out there. For ANS, round goby is probably the most imminent threat. They're currently spreading through the New York Lock and Canal system on their own volition. They're already kind of well established in the Richelieu, Hudson, and Mohawk uh, systems. Koala mussels are a close cousin to the zebra mussels. New Zealand mud sails are also something else that's knocking on the door. And although it's not an immediate threat, Asian carp are also out there. I, I don't know how many folks have heard about Asian carp. They're the ones that when people are driving, they're kind of jumping out, and there's, you know, they, they can cause some pretty serious impacts, not just to people that are boating, but also to altering the food web and the ecosystem out there for other fish species. Um, and one of the really interesting things about them is they actually, um, they actually, when they're small, when they're very young, they actually look almost identical to a gizzard shad, which can be a popular bait fish species. And then fish pathogens, <clears throat> definitely the, the most imminent fish pathogen that's out there. I'll, I'll reiterate, we have not detected VHS in Lake Champlain. <coughs> we maintain fish health testing throughout the state of Vermont, and we haven't detected it yet, but we feel like VHS is kind of an imminent threat that's out there just because of, given the hydrologic connectivity of, uh, of Lake Champlain to other waters like the St. Lawrence River and then you know, through the Champlain Canal system, to other VHS infected waters. So any questions so far on fish pathogens or aquatic nuisance species? Great. So recently folks might have noticed there was an enforcement action that was taken with regards to mosquito fish and imported fathead minnows. Um, to hop into some detail, we were contacted by an angler that he received bait from an area that just seemed off, it didn't seem right. 
provided it to the department, the department looked into it, they actually confirmed uh, a non-native fish species called mosquito fish. After going around and, and checking out where the source came from, we were able to trace the source of bait fish. Uh, they were mixed in with fathead minnows. We traced them back to uh, Hog Island Wholesale, which was kind of the wholesale facility that was distributing out the fathead minnows. And Hog Island Wholesale had actually received that bait from a, a bait farm in Arkansas. It was McCallie Fish Farm in Carlisle, Arkansas. So some of the actions that were taken, um, Hog Island was immediately restricted from selling bait fish that originated from McCallie Fish Farm until further notice. The following day, uh, Hog Island was issued a citation which included a $233 uh, fine, five point license violation, and they were required to destroy and sterilize their units that had fish that had McCallie Fish Farm fish there. Um, one of the things that was in the, the importation permit for Hog Island Wholesale, and they had been aware of in the past, I think we had talked about in a previous board meeting, uh, we had detected at one point back in 2008, 2009, Sean, yeah. uh, three spine stickleback and central mud minnows. And those were present in the shipment that ended up arriving at Hog Island. Um, we had worked with them and said, like, you, know, we, you need to check your shipments, get back to us, let us know if you find anything that's out of the ordinary, you need to contact us right away. Um, so when this happened, we, we followed up with enforcement action because, you know, we, we knew that they were on notice to, to get in touch with us if there was any sort of an issue that came up with inspecting bait and finding something that was different. The interesting thing is when we did this, um, the, the folks there were able to identify and find the fish first before any of our inspectors came there to look within like five minutes. So um, it was something we felt like they had adequate notice for. So they were required to destroy the big fish, and consequently, McCallie Fish Farm was no longer permitted to import fish into the state of Vermont. So some of the additional actions that were taken, the department issued a press release shortly thereafter. Um, I'm really sorry, I thought we had actually shared that with folks on the board, so that was my mistake that we hadn't reached out and provided that, that level of correspondence to folks. Craig? Um, what could you tell us about these mosquito fish? Are they something that would be native to Arkansas, or were they introduced from some other part of the world? Or yeah, so so that's really interesting. Um, I I was talking with folks kind of before the meeting, and I I feel like this whole situation is like if we could categorize it, it's a really good test of the emergency broadcasting system. So. Mosquito fish we don't feel like are going to be able to survive in Vermont waters. They're not very cold tolerant, and especially during ice fishing season, we don't feel like they're going to be able to survive out there. Um, so it's good in that effect that we don't think that this kind of mishap ended up affecting Vermont's fisheries resources. However, that said, this gave us an awesome opportunity to look back, evaluate what worked, what didn't work, where were the fails in the process for ensuring non-native fish species, aquatic nuisance species, fish pathogens, how do we ensure that those don't show up in a shipment here to Vermont? So I think this was like one of those great drills for us to, to really evaluate where we stand on things. And, and I actually have a couple slides coming up to talk about like what worked well, what didn't work well. But are they native to say Arkansas? They, or were they introduced there from some yeah, so around the world? Or what is there? Where are they native to? I believe they are native to Arkansas. Yeah. Sean, is that correct? Yeah, so the western mosquito fish is native to the southern Mississippi drainage. Um, mm -hmm. Mississippi, Louisiana, eastern Texas, Arkansas, um, western Florida. So it's a native fish species down there. They're aware of the possibility of that being in their ponds where they raise their bait because built right into their own protocols down there that's kind of dictated by the Arkansas Safe Bait Program as a whole procedure to go through to reduce the risk of potential of mosquito fish being in those ponds. They have to drain them um, in between um, cohorts or, or you know rearing classes of, of golden shiners and fatheads that they're um, rearing. They have to drain those ponds, they have to dry them out, they have to treat it before they refill and start a new generation of bait fish. Obviously something down there went wrong for them to have shown up like this. 
Yeah. And this is the first time after literally decades of Arkansas fish being shipped to Vermont of mosquito fish ever, you know, being in one of those shipments. So, you know, they just obviously skipped a step at that particular farm in this case. Thank you, Sean. So staff also individually contacted the the 55 Vermont bait dealers because when this press release went out, I'm sure there was a lot of confusion as to like, well, I got fat head minnows from Hog Island. What do I do? So it just provided some 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 information to them that weren't intending to write tickets or find bait shops for anglers that or, or anglers that are found with mosquito fish. We're asking the dealers and providing them with some insight as to how to sort through the bait fish that they currently had, and if found to remove and dispose of them. Either way, we didn't anticipate these fish to survive out there in Vermont's cold waters right now. So there's two main things that went wrong here. One, the Cali fish should have should have had or shouldn't have had mosquito fish in their shipment. As Sean mentioned, the Arkansas State Bait Program specifically calls out best management practices to prevent. Uh, mosquito fish from showing up in their in their program or, or possessing or exporting them. Additionally, our Vermont importation permit only allows for the importation of fish species that are on that list, so they shouldn't have been doing that to begin with. And mosquito fish went unreported by the Vermont wholesaler. I mentioned before that as part of Hog Island uh, wholesale's importation permit, that they have to inspect their bait fish shipments and ensure that no spe other species are present. And if they do, to immediately reach out and notify Vermont Fish and Wildlife that there's some sort of an unauthorized fish species present, and we'd be happy to go up there and take a look and, and react from there. And that, that didn't occur. So in kind of those two fail-safes, those were two main things that went wrong that ended up you know, having to get to the point that an angler, and this is where we kind of hop into what went right, First off, an angler in the community contacted us and let us know about this suspicious bait fish species that was present in their bucket. I think that's something to really talk about is the role that anglers play here as being kind of stewards of the resource, bait fish dealers also in providing some sort of feedback to the department. I and mean, that's the whole reason that we're doing this regulations review process is to gather feedback and help have you know, anglers and bait fish dealers be the ones that are that are helping us out and protecting Vermont's waters. We quickly confirmed and traced the source of mosquito fish. I think it was within two days we had gone, uh, identified the, the mosquito fish, inspected a number of mom and pop's bait shops, and then tracked it back to the wholesaler. And then at the wholesaler, we were able to track it back to McCallie Fish Farm. Our current regulations were able to require the immediate, you know, stoppage, destruction, quarantine and disinfection of bait fish at the wholesale facility at the owner's expense and we also were able to allow for the, imp or the, the prohibition of any more importation immediately upon detecting that unauthorized bait fish shipment from the county fish farm and then finally i think uh we were able to quickly get the word out to vermont's angling community um, we reached out specifically you know through contacting via phone to each one of the bait dealers let them know. And then we also coordinated with other out-of-state fish and wildlife agencies as well as the Arkansas program to let them know what was going on. But I do want to preface all this with, you know, even in the days of completely unregulated and unrestricted movement of bait fish in Vermont, there was still importation of out-of-state sources. So even, even in that day, there wasn't a supply in Vermont to be able to meet the demand of bait fish that's out there. So, you know, as far as whether or not there's a compelling reason to to work and find a workable approach for a bait fish importation, I think there's a there's a compelling reason for us out there to provide some sort of level of bait fish importation. And then finally, just gathering feedback from you. Um, I've seen a, a number of folks at the bait fish uh, public discussion sessions that we've been hosting. You know, ways that I think you can help the, the bait fish regulations review team is, you know, if, uh, if you can attend the public discussion sessions near you, that's great. Um, helping facilitate breakout groups was, was awesome. And, you know, thank, thank you, Craig, Pete, Cheryl, Tim, Teresa, everyone else that, that kind of helped out, or Dennis as well facilitating these, these small groups that really, really made a big difference. 
Um, encourage participation. If folks have feedback, you know, there was recently an email that came out from from a, a bait shop owner in, in Bomazin um, regarding like feedback that they would have. I mean, this is this is the whole reason that our bait fish regulations review is going on is to gather impact from or input from anglers, experiences they've had, comments, things that aren't working. And then also to just gain suggestions on things that can be done to improve the bait fish rings out there. I mean, that's the whole intent of this purpose, right? Or that's the whole intent of this process right now, is to gather that public input to come up with, you know, something that's a workable approach for the public, but then also still provides, you know, serious protection for Vermont's fisheries resources. And if you have any questions, just reach out. Great. I was just trying to picture how feasible it is. I can't really fathom the amount of the volume of bait that Hog Island handles. Uh, I was just wondering how they can handle that much bait and do an effective job of making sure there isn't uh, unwanted mineral species in with that bait uh, with the amount of bait they're importing into the state and distributing to most of the bait dealers and so forth. It's, do you see it as something that's effective and feas feasible what they're doing as far as the monitoring that goes on? In there? So we're actually in the process right now of kind of going through the, the bait deliveries mm -hmm. to find out exactly how much bait is, is coming. We already know, we just have to like get that into paper form mm -hmm. and let folks know about that. Um, with the mosquito fish, yeah, I think there was I think there was an opportunity to, to, to seriously pick them out. I mean, an example of that is just when, when the folks from Fish and Wildlife showed up on site without even knowing what the, the fish species mosquito fish looked like, the owner of the facility was able to walk over to a tank of fathead minnows within five so minutes and say, in hey, is that one? And it, yeah. and it was. So so that to me was, was a good indication that, that there was there is some feasibility to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, somebody, I guess, at the very meeting mentioned, uh, so this is not my idea, but I think it's kind of an interesting one. I don't know whether it's feasible or not. Raising our own minnows at one of our fish culture stations. Is that something that. Um, so, so, speaking from a fish culture perspective, mm -hmm. It would it would be pretty difficult, I think. Um, you know, there's a there's a very limited time period that that like let's say printed aquaculture, you're able to actually grow fish. I mean, they're they're typically more of a warm cool water species of fish, not so much cold water, which is a lot of our hatcheries are suited to cold water, some trout and salmon. Mm -hmm. um, and then that said, you know, we already have like we're running a significant shortage of, of trout. You know, just just yearling just yearling catchable sized trout to be able to be stocked in Vermont waters. We're running about a 25 to a 30% shortage of trout just because of the rock loss of the Roxbury hatchery. Mm -hmm. So I think even with Roxbury coming up online, we're still going to be just barely meeting what we need to for our regular stocking commitments. So it would be, it'd be difficult. But I would say, you know, with unlimited money, unlimited time, unlimited <laughs> staff, anything's possible. <laughs> How is Maine handling that? I know Maine doesn't allow any importation, so it's all got to be native Maine source bait. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that there was a retired uh, warden who was raising smelt. I haven't been able to find out too many details on that, but I was just wondering how how Maine deals with it. There is a similar climate, similar latitude, and so forth as far as either capturing or producing sure. all the bait that's used in Maine you know, without any importation of bait from Arkansas or other oh, sources. Right. Yeah, um, I do know they, you know, they. They've made that decision to actively just kind of shut down their borders where it's just within, mm -hmm. within there. Um, I actually don't know how they, they managed to do that. I'm actually really surprised. I think a lot of people in Maine, maybe there's just a lot less people in Maine that use bait fish. Um, it's just, it's really interesting to me because, you know, it's just in those days. Of, yeah. They have lots more lakes than we do open to ice fishing and so forth. So. Yeah. If anybody on the committee was, was looking into this, has 
communicated with the nearby states or provinces on how they're dealing with issues like that. It just seems like the main not allowing the importation of bait fish, it's, it's all got to be sourced within the state somehow, whether it's reared in ponds or wild captured or... Sean, did you have something on that? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a really, really good question that I've been asked by a lot of fishermen over the last few years, and the reality is, is that they're not keeping up with their demand very well. Mm -hmm. There's only one facility, Jonesy's interacting with this guy that's trying to rear smelt like we talk about, but nobody else is trying to rear other species like golden shiners or fathead minnows. So they're wholly reliant on what's able to be captured, you know, from wild populations. What has happened, um, you may have heard a few years ago, last four or five years, the Zombat case happened, Jonesy. So there was a wholesale facility out of Springfield, Massachusetts called Michael's Wholesale Bait. And they actually um, were charged federally uh, for violating the Lacey Act by transporting and selling um, bait over state lines into, from Massachusetts into Maine mm -hmm. to supply these bait shops that were out of bait, basically, because they can't keep up with their demand. So these bait shops started looking around Despite the regulations that they have in place that says no importation, they were desperate. They're like, we need bait. Fishermen want bait. So they went to the length of actually getting Michael's Wholesale to ship bait over state lines, violation of not only state rules, but federal rules. And that guy went to jail for that. And lost his business. So it's something we've talked about within our bait fish group, but the reality is that's that's very difficult to do to basically build a wall and, and keep everything internal. And like Adam said, when we first started kind of reviewing bait fish regulations 20 years ago, I spent a lot of time talking to bait um, harvesters up and down Lake Champlain to learn about their operations and their businesses. And even on the best of years, when they're, they were still allowed to net wild emerald shiners, yeast and silvery minnows and sell them for use all across Vermont, they couldn't keep up, they couldn't put enough bait up for the winter, and they still brought bait in from Arkansas when they ran out. So, just don't think it's an option. But it could, so if, it would be nice to encourage maybe uh, mineral rearing if it was feasible in Vermont, even if it was only to supplement or uh, at least it's money circulating in the local economy instead of just millions of dollars every year going from Vermont to Arkansas. Just, well, we'd, we'd be all for it. Yeah. yeah. Some, yeah. Question. Hogger Island got five points. Yes. They get caught again, that's another five points, they lose their license. Yeah. What do we do? So... No supplier. Yeah, so, so it'd have to be if they get caught again within a in the major year, so five years. It'd be within a five-year period if they violate it again to have another five-point violation. Then they would lose their privilege for a year. Correct. Right. The the points are good for five years. Yeah. So they would lose their license for a year. So so yeah, there would there would have to be a significant change. And I think right now, what we're what we're seeing in the in the bait fish industry just in Vermont is kind of the scrambling, trying to find even a source for fathead minnows right now. Um, so yeah, there's there there's there's a a serious you know issue there that if something like that would happen, I mean we obviously need to protect the resource and, and provide that level of protection, but you know how do you do that in a manner that that is in the best interest of the public while still protecting for the resource? So it's a really good question. Great. So so I got a call from Mike Dingrass, owner of Hog Island, also. Yeah. And I know two other board members, I know Pete and Cheryl, you tell them too. And uh, one of his concerns was is that since 2008, when he got the first violation, you know, he has to give the state 24 hour notice every time your truck comes to deliver bait. And nobody's been here since 2008. This is according to him. You know, I really questioned him. I said, Are you sure? He says, To my recollection, nobody's been here since then. So he was concerned about that, and I think he wants to see some state intervention here to make sure he doesn't do the wrong thing. 
Um, he also said he wouldn't mind having the board going out there and checking out the facility and see what, what goes on there and the amount of bait that he handles. I know that when he had to destroy those fat heads, there was like 700 pounds. I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of minnows. And what, how many pounds of the, the, the other ones? Like two or 300 pounds of those. So, and he's also concerned about his license. He's the only wholesaler in the state. And whether we like it or not, anglers, this board and the Fish and Wildlife Department are stuck with this bait regulation. And I really feel like it'd be in the best interest of everybody to keep him in business. And if that means getting an independent inspector or a state inspector out there to check his bait, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, so those are things we're thinking about and considering how to how to deal with going forward, how to how to create a chain of custody uh, kind of system in which we're we have more security and more assurance that bait's clean. I don't want to say too much about an enforcement action, but all I'll say is that I think we were extremely lenient in dealing with this given the history. So I agree. I know he has protocol to follow, and he apparently did not. However, like I said, if he ever went out of business, you know, I don't know what the, yep. what's the state going to do. I mean, they're just not going to have bait. It would be a big so, problem. That's right. And I, I know, obviously, the state can take the hard line, but I'd like to see, you know, some sort of cooperation between the state and the wholesaler to just try to make sure this doesn't ever happen again. Yep. So one of the, one of the things that we're, you know, looking into right now is just. <clears throat> You know other other options out there. So, so fathead minnows was like one of the concerns. You know, is what's what's happening with the source of fathead minnows. And we're we're reaching out proactively, looking at different sources, seeing. You know, we're not doing the full evaluation, but what what seems to make sense. I think just providing that guidance to the bait fish industry is really important. That if we can find something that is a workable approach that still provides protection for the resource, and and maybe kind of front load some of that. That, that would be helpful and in the best interest of everyone, especially in the fisheries resource. Then. And also, I think, you know, an appearance from a biologist or game warden, occasionally, you know how people get last, last of days mm -hmm. after a while, you know, they don't pay attention. I mean, you've got that much bait going in there. You know, you're not going to stay there for an hour on end watching it go in the tank. If somebody would show up there occasionally and make sure he's following protocol, even if you got a checklist that he has to show you or something, you know. Yeah. He's definitely nervous. Yeah. He's concerned if something slips through and he doesn't catch it. Yeah. Well, as as uh, Craig says, so are we. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Is there? A, I know in the communications, which I would say were excellent from the department to the to the Bombazine bait dealer. Um, I know the topic of having just a dealer meeting or hearing is that being considered at this point is that you know, as critical as this is yeah. getting them involved as a group maybe we we looked at it and we actually discussed it at our Friday our, we had a meeting on Friday this past Friday and we discussed that particularly as an agenda item and we've actually had a pretty pretty good amount of bait dealers showing up at the meeting and we've had good feedback from them where we feel like just just encouraging participation from dealers at those meetings is is good, and I think in that in that email that that response that came back from that baitfish dealer in particular, he brought up this idea of like perception from the public of of being in cahoots with with the baitfish industry. I think actually like having like a dealer only meeting would only help to reinforce that perception. So if there's a way that we can still gather input from them just through a public discussion session. I think that's kind of what our group had decided made the most sense. I, I don't think it would be uh, entirely fair to some of the bait fish dealers who have gone to the to the existing meetings and, you know, sat through them, listened to them, contributed through those meetings, to then have a special bait fish dealer meeting that they're either in the position of, oh, I gotta give up another few hours to go to another meeting and present my my point of view as a bait fish dealer where I've already given it in this other meeting or their other option is well I've given it once I'm not going to go to the other meeting and 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 then it, it appears as though they're not interested so I I, I 
I, uh, I think we're committed to sharing any drafts and draft proposals that go yeah. public with them and soliciting their input there. And we'd very much like them to attend these hearings, as, as some already have. Um, but I, you know, maybe if we started the process in the beginning and known this was going to happen in the middle of it, we might have done that. But I think to do it now is a little unfair to those who participated through the through the public meeting. Uh, Adam, that's that's a whole <laughs> the gentleman who wrote that, he did go to that mm -hmm. meeting, yeah. right? He did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he had the opportunity to provide. He's so. actually at Tim Stables. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Have you contacted New York? Because he told me that he supplies a lot of dealers over there. So, yeah, so so part of like when the mosquito fish showed up, right. um, immediately I contacted Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, just as a courtesy heads up to them, and New York. And I called them the day that we actually confirmed mosquito fish. Um, he said he supplies a lot of bait dealers. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was one of the first things we did because we wanted to get out in front of it and let them know because that that supplier supplies a lot of frogs in New England. Funnily enough, uh, Tom Jones and I stopped by that bait shop to buy bait uh, a week before all this happened, so our timing was perfect. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. I would just like to thank all of you that are on this big little review talking for the extra time you're putting into it and the effort. It looks to me like you're not leaving a stone unturned. Uh, it's a very comprehensive review and Hey, Craig, thanks for that. Yeah. You know why? Because Tim and I have missed a lot of our own personal work days and time to attend these meetings every two weeks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that everything that you're doing, Sean, Tom, Adam, uh, it's appreciated. We still hear more comments about the people, I think, than anything else to do with Fish or wildlife, and you know, what you're doing, I think it's fantastic. Well, by the way, we all know what you're doing. You're doing, yeah, doing well. <laughs> Thanks for saying that, Craig. That was well, well put. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is Dave Salto on uh, the waterfowl. Yeah, Teresa, um, given that you're probably going to be your dinner's going to arrive as good as it is. Yeah, now we're nine minutes or so. Okay. Um, if we want to do just a couple other housekeeping things, sure. Um, sure. The next item, my suggestion is um, two two handouts that you should have with you is the uh, the board calendar. Does everybody follow that? It's this sheet that starts with July at the top it goes on the back being empty. Just want to bring that to your attention, and, and we'll make sure that all the stuff is attached to your minutes, and that we'll get them to you on the draft minutes. So anybody have any questions on that? Um, what, what I will note to you is um, we don't have any meeting next month. And the next sheet I'll refer to in a minute has a whole bunch of March, Carl Spring, uh, deer moose hearings, among other waterfall hearings, and some bait fish I think meetings are in there. So looking at that schedule too is in uh, April 25th, um, depending on what happens, um, actually anyways, no, it doesn't matter what happens tonight regarding the moose. You also will be the, the uh, final decision being made on the moose hunting permit numbers there. And that'll be after we have the, the three public hearings, meetings. So we're trying to start with whatever you decide tonight, that'll, that'll be one note that to you, as well as um, that'll be your first vote on the Antlers. The, um, let me just jump ahead. One other handout you have, it's, which looks this way, the Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife Board winter spring meeting schedule. Everybody got that one? I'll make sure you folks. I don't have one. Where's that? That should have been in your packet. Okay. Or you have some more? Oh, okay. Yeah, Here's one more, more extra. Let's make sure it's electronically. Yeah. Can you just email them to us? Yeah. Well, they're not there now, but um, I, can, I can actually give you this other copy if you need it. Thank you. Has everybody got one? Okay. So, Teresa, knowing that Kevin's not here, you might want to take a couple minutes and just make sure that we have board members present at um, minimum the uh, the three waterfall hearings, mm -hmm. 
meetings that we have, and then the three uh, deer and moose, at least for now, get us through March since we don't have a board meeting. So maybe you just want to do a check to make sure somebody from the board at least is going to one of those meetings. You said waterfowl and over there? Yeah, starting on uh, March 13th, the waterfowl meeting at Bennington Town Firehouse. We, um, that was a, a special um, meeting that we decided to hold extra this year. I appreciate Dave for doing that and the staff giving on a couple southern uh, duck and goose hunters we heard from. So maybe if, if you want to just go through that quick, just to make sure we're covered. We don't need to know everybody that's going to go, but I hate to have one of these meetings and not have a board member be present at one of them. Okay. So that'll mean someone may have to drive a long distance if someone locally is not going to cover the meeting. Okay. So for the March 13th waterfowl hearing in Bennington, Dennis, Dave, myself. Okay. Okay. The waterfowl hearing on March 15th in Essex. I got that covered. Uh, Whitehall, New York on 320. Hey, Dennis, you picking me up? <laughs> I'll meet ya. <laughs> okay. So we got the waterfowl seems to be covered. The deer hearing, 319 Montpelier. 321 in Windsor. I better go I'll to go. that one. Yeah, you better show up. I better show up to that one. Yeah. Better attend. We appreciate your help finding that place for us. We hadn't had a meeting. I don't know if we've ever had one in Windsor. We've had them nearby, so yeah. thank you yeah. for that help. 322 Orleans. I'm raising my hand it's the day after my term expires, but I'll be there anyway. Oh no! With a different voice. One day, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, Bennington Town Firehouse. Okay. 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 For analyst deer hunting and for moose hunting, okay. and to do that, we need to have a 30-day public input period before the board makes a final decision on the permits, and we need to hold the three uh, minimum of three hearings for moose, and we need to hold um, five uh, hearings for deer. for deer. Those are around the state as prescribed by board rule, but the board decided years ago this is where we're going to have those, so we're we're kind of bound to make sure we hit those regions. And um, sometimes in the past, we've even had some extras be beyond that. The process for new board members is, you notice there's kind of a split between March and then May. We've done that so at least when the permit process comes forward in May, that the public has a chance to give us input and respond to the actual permits that the board has decided to put forward on the kind of a straw vote the department's going to recommend. And that'll happen in late April. The department, uh, our dear Viles Nick will be here and present to you our permit recommendations for next fall. You will hear about the, the moose permit stuff tonight, whether you decide to recommend zero, 15, 200, whatever it happens to be. So, um, that'll be. so that's, does that help understand yeah. the difference to those? Thank you. So you, there's some bounds that are set by statute and board rules of when and where can be. Okay, um, the last item that we can... Can I do the last Yes, item? absolutely. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, May you got me off track. <laughs> May 8th, deer hearing in Rutland? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, May 10th, in South Burlington. Shouldn't we assign Patrick to some of these? Yeah. All of them. It's not here. <laughs> well, you're asking for it. He's, he's, he's going to Whitehall. Right he doesn't know. Yeah, Whitehall, right Bennington. That's, that's the two he's going to. Okay. You won't ask for a year tonight. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so the, the process that we do, we do this jointly uh, together with the, the department and the board. Uh, these hearings will be very much as we've done in the past. We will have presentations by, you know, the, the, the technical staff. In the beginning, obviously, we'll have introductions of board members are there, someone from the board to describe a little bit to the public in attendance what the board's uh, process is all about and the high salaries that you collect and, and so forth every year. Uh, and then we will continue to break out in, in um, small group format with a large group and have a reporting back. And we're going to do that this year for Waterfall, uh, the first time that we've done that group. And I, and I think it's it's about maybe about time. There seems to be a lot of interest now 
with people hitting you folks up and with us about you know, the goose seasons and the timing of the duck season. So that'll, we'll try to focus those questions a, a little bit more to try to understand instead of just doing straw votes. How many people want to have it that we hunt them in December or January? So um, we're going we're gonna to work on that um, this year. So uh, we're going to continue with that format until you and the public tell us they don't like it. Um, so it, it seems to work. And I, I only get positive response everywhere I go on that because they, they People who never used to get a chance to speak or feel part of the meetings go away feeling they were they were listening to it. So, okay, the last the third sheet I will draw your attention to that I put on the board later and um, was this one that says Fish and Wildlife Board member regulatory timeline comments from your last meeting where we had the little tear sheets up on the wall and everybody went around and made some comments under each subject and, and put some from your perspective in the. The little uh, crosses under after each one, the plus signs, or how many people kind of identify that as an issue to them, or when the board they like to take yeah. these up again. So that should be in the packet. It's the very last page of the page. previous okay. meeting's minutes. Oh, okay. Well, that's like, why I don't yes. Oh, you don't, don't have it? It's not in the packet tonight? No, it, it is. It's on the back. Anybody want minutes. this one? Or can't find yours? Share, share. share. Okay. I don't, I don't have the have minutes. Have okay. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. The minutes aren't here. Um, anyway, being just looking on with your neighbor, but um, the I haven't done my homework on that one yet, so it's on tonight's agenda. So I want to put that back on your, I think, on your schedule. I put it back to April fourth um, at your next meeting um, to bring that discussion back for you. Okay, and the only reason we did this is try to to develop some order. And uh, thinking to the future and some, some kind of uh, input on your part on how often you want to revisit some of these, these rules and petitions that come before the board. It seemed to be the last few years that you were getting a petition every other month on a different topic and we were just trying to did this little exercise to help you. So your working document, the planning document, and it doesn't take away the role of the department feels any emergency need to come before you with a rulemaking on a, a species going south on us or a big issue, we'll do that. If it's under your your peru your peru 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 per, sorry can't speak to it. So any questions on that? What, what you're looking at in front of you? We'll put it in the minutes again. Um, so I need to have a, a, a little more internal discussion with staff and with management team um, to try to try to take what you gave for input and then offer our input back and try to to uh, see your reaction to that. So I know, for example, uh, the land rule. For example, what I'm talking about is. Uh, staff's been bugging me for almost two years to our state lands team that meets on a regular basis to come back with looking at that rule again and making some changes um, potentially. And I kept saying no, no, no. Uh, you know, you're obviously saying let's put it up in the future, but I, I think if we're at a period where we're not being inundated with lots of other work that you have to do, I'll probably talk with the management team and my, my staff and say, well, can we maybe look at this in, within the next two years? Um, to do with that. So any questions on what that is all about, that exercise? So how it may work in reality is if we get a petition on a specific topic, say on trapping or fur bear, we may try to go back to this. And that doesn't mean the board can't take it up all the time. But you may decide, well, we decided since we just had the trapping rule open, you know, there's no immediate, you know, issues with populations or numbers from, from a science perspective, we may wait for another two years to do it. That's all what that is, just some kind of planning tool and guidance document for the board members and understanding the board members coming go off the board. Okay, any other questions on that? Yeah. I, I just think that's going to be very helpful to the public as well, knowing that there's kind of a set way. I mean, we talked about this with the bait fish, knowing that maybe it'll come up every four years, but yeah. we're not going to just deal with a petition or if the board, you know, I'm not saying we're not, but it just we'll makes sense. It just makes sense to yeah. to have some sort of a systematic approach to these petitions. So I think this is a good idea. All right, well, thank you. And, yeah. and you know, that's I, we only did we only did this just for your help. Uh, and, you know, obviously we have lots of talks, and one of the, the big reasons that is a concerning factor of people participating in hunting, fishing, and trapping is rural complexity and mm -hmm. changing all the time. And, and there is quite a staff cost, and as well as administrative cost for the state of Vermont too change rules and regulations all the time. It seemed to work really well with deer rule last time. And that was just kind of a, a general person's agreement with the board that let's wait and visit this every 30 years. Or so that's all. <coughs> and you can change it. You know, we can have this discussion in here and not say, well, let's kind of, I'd like to move this up a little more than we kind of uh, agreed to on the board. So, 
Okay. All right. What's those three topics that we want to get to? Right. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. We'll break for dinner. All right, so we're going to have uh, Dave's going to do his presentation on the water bottle, please. Introduction. Yeah, quite the intro. Um, Okay. Um, most of you, I think, have already met Dave Sodgeville, our waterfall biologist um, that we have. Before that, worked out at Dead Creek. Previously worked with uh, Ducks Unlimited before he came to Vermont. Actually, I've always loved to tell that he started his career as a Vermont Fish Wildlife Department at Green Mountain Conservation Camp, Lake Bombazine. And that's, I think, it's one of the first years that, that I started over with the camp program, or second out of whatever. I was green horn back then. He never did hold that history. <laughs> but uh, and, and, uh, from Bennington, Vermont, which is neat. Be a Vermonter, come through, go to conservation camps, come back to work in the summer, go to college, go and get a master's degree, come back and work for us. And now having uh, a project that entails a, a lot of a lot of different birds from migratory birds. And Dave is also plays a significant hat in the Atlantic Flyway Council. And I think he talked to some of you about that. That's uh, 17 states, a couple provinces, roughly. I'm always wrong, so correct me, please do. So, Dave gave a, a presentation a little bit less of what we thought we would do tonight, this follow format, very similar to what we did the last two years that worked quite well, uh, in our estimation, from other board members' feedback. But as Dave will give, give a quick overview of where we are with some of the recommendations that were mailed to you, and then we're going to walk through what the outcome we need tonight is a quick straw vote from each of you is. How do you feel about these topics that we want to present to waterfall hunters and the public at the public hearings so you get some feedback before you do your final vote in April? And you said what, April 30th is probably the final deadline that the commissioner on behalf of the board here will submit to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service our recommendations for next fall for waterfall hunting. Sound good? All right, good. Dave, I'll turn it over to you and then later I'm going to walk through and then we're going to stand by to answer any questions on some of the key things we need your input on. So, uh, Mark asked me to just go through really quickly the process and how we come about to the recommendations, and not only on the department, but so as you mentioned, within the flyway, we meet twice a year. I'm taking off this Sunday and heading down to New Jersey. Everybody from the 18 or 17 states and provinces are coming together from Georgia to uh, the eastern provinces. And this February meeting is more about um, research that's going on, surveys that we're going to be conducting come spring and summer. And then we also have a meeting in the fall, September, and that's where we talk about recommendations, looking at all the information that's been gathered over the summertime. We usually don't get the reports from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service on their surveys until late August. So we meet in September. We make recommendations to us to council and marks our representative as a council of the states and provinces are represented in the council. And that's in uh, conjunction with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, any of the nonprofits that are interested in being there. Um, recommendations go on to what they call the Service Regulatory Commission. They bring all the flyways together, the four flyways, and listen to the comments. Those recommendations, once it's decided, go into the Federal Register or you know, posted, and then they come back to us and say, this is the framework we have to work with. And that's what we're coming to with you right now is our outside dates. Within our own department, the way we start, after the seasons, even during the seasons, you all get comments from the public. I get received comments. Uh, I speak to the field wardens to see how the seasons have been going and what comments they've been having there. So we draft up our preview and kind of broad recommendations that you've all received. That was reviewed by Mark and, and Scott Darling after I brought it together. And then it went up through management team to see if they had any other issues that they thought about. And then it was brought down to, uh, to the board. And that's what you're, you're looking at here. Uh, some of the main bullets that we have tonight, it's not much has changed since last year. We're still looking pretty good. So we're, we're looking at the liberal season of 60 days and 66 birds per day. Um, you can be more restrictive if you want to in some areas. That's one, one of the aspects. Uh, 2018 duck season. Uh, this year is supposed to be a Saturday starter. If we continue with the two Wednesdays and Saturday. The, if you with Lake Champlain, we're recommending a split. We're not recommending one for the interior. Part of that comes from when we're looking at that survey that we spoke about in January. 
you should have all received a copy of that too, I think, electronically. And I know one person asked for it, and Mary sent it out to them. Um, the seasons that we're recommending for the interior was starting on Saturday, October 13th, and having that run straight through December 11th. So that'd be for the interior zone. We looked at the survey, um, most of the folks in the interior zone, they wanted a straight season. They are interested in having most of the days in October and then there most of the remaining days in November. And very few had interest in December. A lot of the interior does freeze up earlier than the Champlain zone. The season that we're looking at proposing for the Champlain zone was to go from October 13th and run it through the 28th of October. That's a little different than past years where we recommended a five day season, then we take a two week break and then try to figure out where to distribute the rest of the days. So we're looking at putting more days in October and then proposing to split it until November 10th and then run it through December 23rd. And part of our reasoning there was when we looked at the survey, um, a large percentage of people they wanted, I think it was about 40% wanted in most of the days in October, 40, 45% of them, and then the remaining people wanted to evenly split between November and December, and that's where we tried to uh, balance it out. And I went through the days uh, with the way, what we propose now. There's 16 days in October, 21 in November, and 23 in December. So I'm trying to balance that out. Um, so that's with the, within the seasons. The next part that we were looking at was when to start the season, whether on Saturdays <coughs> and, uh, or Wednesdays. And this year I was proposing something a little different after this year. Uh, looking at the numbers, I thought possibly of going or, or recommending a Wednesday and Saturday alternating every other year. When did that whole two Wednesday and one Saturday thing? The previous survey back in the early 2000s. So there's about 65%, almost 70% that wanted Wednesday starting and then the remainder oh, okay. wanted, so we, they went back and forth. <laughs> and so that's, I was looking at the numbers and within the Lake Champlain zone, about 45% wanted Wednesday. 33% wanted Saturdays, and then there's another 22% that had no opinion. It could go either way. So, uh, some of the reasoning between going to uh, additional Saturdays, uh, if you look at when the majority of people hunt uh, weekdays, only about 12% hunt the majority of the time during the weekdays. Looking at having additional days available for school age hunters to get in there and recruit them, and also uh, just maintaining recruiting new people that have to work and can only hunt on weekends. So that was part of my thought process. Right. Um, the next one was looking at the September, September goose season, recommending starting it on September 1st and running it through the 25th, maxing out our 25 days that were allotted. Have eight birds per day. And with the migratory population of Canada geese, we're recommending that it start on the same day as the duck season, Saturday, October 13th, and then running that straight through for the uh, 50 days that were allotted with a three bird daily bag. Part of um, my process there, I know we've had some comments come into the commissioner about trying to split that season. <coughs> Again, I went back to the survey and I looked at what the majority of the hunters wanted and they prefer straight seasons and that's what we are recommending. But, but I can uh, predict that in the Bennington uh, at the Bennington meeting, you're going to hear a lot of folks who, or, or a group of a group of hunters who would like to see that that split. One individual told me that he's going to rent the bus and offer free beverages to bring the crew. So uh, maybe, maybe a good sized crew. Which Teresa, I won't show up. Yeah. I grew up there in the '80s and saw the deer hearings and time waiting time to go into the fields. So hopefully, a little more civil this time. Brutal. What would be the option of having a split season if the public gained it? You can have one split just like the So what day would you recommend? Oh boy. That would you know, the way we have the season now, we can't start till the tenth. And that's intentional to allow some of the migrants go through. And the bulk of the birds are moving through in October and and, and early November. So that's what would happen is we pick a split and that's when they would push through. That's the, the fear I have, honestly. And that's why I don't recommend a split. Um, so it's it's wide open when you can do that. You know, a lot of people are saying that the birds are coming in right after the, the season's over. And you know, reports of hundreds of them coming off the bay. I was actually 
hunting in those areas, and I saw the birds there prior to the, the season closing on Champlain. And I, what I think part of it is is we're taking the pressure off the birds, and they're all congregating again and going back out to the fields. And that's I can't prove that because we're not shooting any in December. We're not doing any returns. But I think if we actually um, could get ID some of those birds, um, we would see that it's still our resident birds that we're shooting. So, but so going back, I mean, I don't know when I would recommend. Honestly, I wouldn't recommend okay. a slip, but that's more of a preference of the hunters. And then, as you know, there'll be as many preferences. So, so going on to snow geese, uh, <coughs> recommending an October 1st start, running that right through to the end of the year. And then um, what I looked at on the season was we open, we close it Friday before, the last day is Friday before the youth turkey, and I tried to backdate it from there and use our complete 107 days available for that season. Our conservation order days are, uh, we allow 15 birds by regulation that was set up years ago, and during the regular season, they allow 25 birds. So we try to maximize that. The one change this year that we had is that the pintail, northern pintail population increased and went over the threshold, so we're able to actually offer two birds a day instead of one. And that's what we're recommending. And then the use of waterfowl season is usually the last weekend in September, which would be the 29th and 30th. And we're recommending that hopefully it'll be a little cooler this year. Last year I know it was very warm and mosquitoes were, were all pretty prevalent for people. It was a little, about a week earlier the way the calendar fell. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that the weekends fall sometimes. And then um, the final portion uh, was woodcock and snipe season. Which we're recommending again October 1st through um, November 14th. Maine actually just did a recent pilot study and it was interesting to see many of their birds were leaving Maine and around uh, October 30th through November 5th. So we're right about there when the birds are coming through, but most of them seem to overshoot us, and within four days they were down in uh, Pennsylvania and the Carolinas. So they, they do some pretty quick flights. And then just as a note on uh, page 15 of the preview, it has uh, a summary of the recommendations. And when we're, with our seasons, we're, we're setting them for the Champlain zone and the inland zone. I have an email in my counterpart, Jessica, in, in, uh, in New Hampshire, and they don't have any dates yet for their so interior zone, or inland zone, which would be like Connecticut or the zone. So we'll, well, I'll be seeing her this weekend, and we'll talk about her today, so we can give you more information. Uh, one thing I can tell you about the public meetings is that uh, New York staff is going to be at the White Hall to help us there, and they'll be at the Essex to answer questions on the New York seasons and recommendations. And hopefully uh, Josh Stiller, who's out of Albany and is their waterfowl biologist, will be able to go to the bank to meet him. He said he's going to try to, to meet us there, so we'll have some more help there. Will the water be taking the lead on that? Yes, because the board will wave as we talked about having the present, and then I'll give a general presentation of bridge of what we usually do, and then we'll do the breakout groups. I'm also still going to have um, comment cards that people can fill out if they don't want to stay for a breakout or if they don't want to make a comment. Um, at least the public speaking can be intimidating for them. And as we mentioned, April board meeting will be the final vote, and then we have to have all the paperwork in by September 30th. But, you know, if you, whatever you decide on the 4th, by the 5th or 6th, we can have that wrapped up in the recommendations on the commissioner's desk and have it with us. You know, within a week, and then they review it to make sure there's no errors that they they see on there, and then it goes into the federal register with all the states that have. Yeah, I think that's it. Super. What? What? I uh, I had a question regarding yeah. the mallards. Mm -hmm. I know we had a presentation last year regarding the red flags in your mm -hmm. population. Are you recommending a change in the back limit for mallards? Not yeah. at this time. If we we're going to do anything, it would be uh, season light. And bag limbs really don't have any effect. And what research has shown is days of exposure to hunting. That's what really affects it. And at this time, we're not going to recommend anything. We're talking about it within the within the flyway. But also, one of the questions that I had for the breakout groups was, if we had to maintain a liberal 60-day season, 
for all the other species, would you be willing to accept a little more complexity of having a season within a season and say if we needed a 45 or 50 day season on mallards only? We, we've done those back in the 80s and where you, you know, when it's a 30 day season and you're only allowed to shoot black ducks for right. like 15 days. And it's just, you have to definitely look at your syllabus and it makes it a little harder for law enforcement and the hunters, but <coughs> that gives you sometimes flexibility to still maintain, you know, record levels of green wing teal and, and wood ducks are doing fine so you can still harvest them, you know, during the 60 day season, but maybe we need a 50 day season of mallards if it comes to that. But so you're comfortable right now saying mallards continue with it <coughs> as it is and no other adjustments to that season right. date? Our overall, I think within the flyway, within the distance <coughs> survey area and our north or Atlantic surveys, they're going down slightly. We're being buffered by the eastern survey area because their numbers are up while our numbers are a little bit down. The 72 plots that we do in Vermont, we're seeing just a slight increase to stable even though we're not seeing as many birds, but we're not seeing as many coming from other areas as we're seeing at this point. So at this point, you know, there's still 700,000, so we're not going to over-harvest them here in Vermont, for sure. Wasn't the worry in the 80s, Dave, that uh, mallards have displaced black ducks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of hybridization. I remember um, Main professor Jerry Long, of course, the best thing you can do for black yeah, ducks is kill every mallard you see. You know. Yeah. But, you know, with our habitat changes that we have here, you know, it's just we're more like the Midwest now. You know, you really ducks that well. <laughs> <laughs> Some vague thing from the back of my head. <laughs> I think I said this last year, too, where you need to get those provinces to adjust their bag limits accordingly. That's well, our problem. Big steps, though, right? Part of it is what it is. Well, we have a parity with them, and they actually shoot fewer birds. We're almost 50 50 now, but a lot of the hunters that go up there are U.S. hunters that buy tags, so it's not. It's not you can shoot eight mallards there. Right. Uh, but my question really was since we, um, I think it was like two or three years ago, the board elected to start the early resident. Canada goose season mm -hmm. on the first rather than wait till after the holiday. Mm -hmm. Have you had any issues since we've done that? I haven't had any. The only issue I ever had was somebody hunting off a of town beach one time. That was it. Okay. That's not a <laughs> so we haven't had complaints, so it's been good. good. For new board members on that, um, Craig, you can explain your eye fill. Um, for a while when we could hunt this early season, they'd call it on the Canada geese, trying to hunt resident birds. They're in Vermont, that's what's designed in September. The department was always recommending to the board to hold it after Labor Day. And then we got, so the way the calendars were working, you were shortchanging our early season, like quite a bit, almost a week yeah. uh, sometimes. So and then we decided to try it, and lo and behold, we didn't see the conflicts or the complaints come forward that thought might be there from people still being present in their camps on Labor Day. <laughs> people all shooting, quote, in their words, their pet geese. And so, I think there's been enough nuisance geese with droppings on their lawns and trying to keep yeah. them off that geese have lost some. Has there been any studies on diseases that the geese carry? I think there was some concern in the Midwest affecting turkey populations, and there was heavy geese population, and something the diseases they were carrying having an effect on the turkey populations in the Midwest. And I don't know of any. Well, I mean, the ones I know, avian influenza, no, which, they were, was, which is always out there in nature. Um, it's more a concern for these large poultry, turkey and, you know, and chicken operations. But, you know, you'd have to eliminate it. I mean, you wouldn't even eliminate the disease if you removed all wild birds. I read something, it was, the concern was, uh, was Missouri was having a big, significant decline in turkey populations. And, and they were, turkey. wild turkey, and they were attributing it to possibly the increase in the Canadian goose. I haven't. Anybody yeah, else? I haven't. Um, I haven't seen anything like that. But it, it's something we're very vigilant about is wildlife diseases. And just so the board knows, at some point we can do a little more review with you. Is we spent a considerable amount of resources in the department, um, not only trying to train staff what to look out for. You sit on the what responsibility <coughs> you sit on in terms of the, the waterfall, 
birds and birds. this kind of disease, big game. Or big game and disease. So some of you might have met Walt Cottrell, who we hire as, as part time in the department. He came, he helped us through the deer yard band, but he works now with uh, Tufts University and we're constantly doing training back and forth. If I get an email, maybe once a month, I shoot it to somebody's concerned if they see something. So, that's it's on the horizon. We're doing the best we can with our limited resources to have all our staff trained in. But the question of avian influenza is one that uh, Lewis and I are quite familiar with because we've kind of gone head to toe with the Department of Agriculture on that. And if, if they want to kind of put it on the wild birds, it's causing the problem. In reality, if you look at the science, it's it's poor husbandry practices on the dairy farms, and people letting wild birds intermix with their domestic birds. And, not having good good hygiene practices on those facilities. And that really is the bottom line. So we kind of really step forward real hard when all of a sudden you might see a news story, someone from another fire state government said, oh, you know, the waterfall is going to be migrating now. Be careful, farmers, you know. <laughs> well, no, farmers practice good husbandry practices. Keep your birds to home. Walt, Walt was one of the first ones that brought up the, the disease started in the north and was moving south through the farms while the geese and the birds were migrating north. So opposite way. It was going the opposite mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just fun meetings for you, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. So, well, poultry yeah. farms, right? Oh. You're talking about yes. poultry farms? Poultry yes. farms. Birds. Yeah, we don't want the dairy farms to do them some of the chickens. <laughs> So anyway, I think we can move through this really quick. Um, and Dave, I'm going to, if anybody comes up with any questions of this, um, I really want to commend you on the survey you've done, the study, um, your work with this, um, really thorough. And one thing that's opened my eyes being able to sit at the Atlantic Flyway Council where I carry Vermont's vote on all these issues and ballots and things you're asking about, trees and what models, is the amount of work that Dave and his counterparts do together. They get together for five days and um, I tell you, that's five days from eight o'clock till nine or ten before they finally find the hospitality suite. But incredibly long days, cranking a lot of a lot of data, and, um, a lot of statisticians um, that are involved with this work. So it's something I know I could never touch with my skills. So, Mark, given this is yeah. a straw vote, yeah. I, uh, I assume that the board, if it chose to do so, could do this with both hands. That would be the fastest. We don't need no names. That's a, I'm glad you mentioned that, Lewis. Um, that's what we did the last time. And again, this is so that you can come back and, and we're putting something for the hunters to react to. And, and you can change this in April if you want uh, to depend on the input. But we'll be here also to respond to you. I'll have Dave on um, what we're hearing at the meetings. It's quite different from what we recommend. Let's see, I'm probably going to go back and remind you what the survey said, the history, what the ramifications are if you did a split in the goose season or if you open it later or whatever. So. Okay, so let me go through this really quickly. Um, the first bullet, you all know, got the sheet. I'm going to go through these bullet by bullet. And as Commissioner said, we'll just show our hands. Um, hold the liberal seeds, and that's basically just the maximum amount of hunting days that the, the framework in the land fly will allow us to have, a 60 day season under the federal framework. Is that people have, where are we on that? Everybody raise your hand who's supporting us of the liberal hunting season that Vermont has, and every state has that option in the flyway. Charlie, you up? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, when to open the season? So, second bullet is open the uh, next fall's hunting season on a Saturday. We've been doing alternating twice a day. So how many on Saturday? Raise your hand. Okay, 12 again. Okay. Um, open this year, it's the same question in a way, but these are getting to the dates. Um, so, I actually, let me just go back. The first bullet will probably give us guidance for next year. Two that we may come back and recommend Wednesday, you could change it to a Saturday if you want, just to let you know. Instead of going two years Wednesday, one year Saturday, we're going to probably rec think about looking at one day, one year Saturday, this year, next year Wednesday. But again, the board has a prerogative. If you want to go back with a Saturday, we'll share with you what we feel the people want from the survey results we have. Mm -hmm. Number two, this year, the proposed season will be October 13th. And for the interior zone of Vermont, um, and to run through December 11th. So again, if there's any question, if you don't understand what an interior zone is or Champlain, Connecticut, we got the guy here to answer that. Okay, all those in favor? Okay. Um, Lake Champlain zone, split season between those dates, 13th to the 28th of October, and November 10th through December 23rd. All those in favor? Okay, every. Uh, that just uh, you would know or? An, I want to know. Okay. Or no. Okay, 11 1 is what I got. Anybody else to know? That will be one in your area. We'll probably we hear lots of different opinions, and understandably so. Um, alter, okay, I'm not I'm going to skip that. We already the first one. Um, the approach between Wednesday and Saturdays. I already got the sense that you want to go that way, alternate it. 
um, unless I hear something from people now. Okay. Opening the resident can of goose season September 1 through the 25th, maximizing the 25 days we have available. All those in favor? 11 1. Cheryl, Cheryl, are you? Yeah, yeah you're there. Okay. 12. All right. 12 0. Um, when to hold the 2018 migratory goose season? Um, this would be, we're proposing to open it on October 13th, so it coincides with the duck season opener. That'd be on a Saturday. All those in favor? <clears throat> okay. 12 again. 12 again. Snow goose on October 1. Open then. Show of hands. Okay. We've got everybody. There are names, so it doesn't matter. Increase <laughs> the northern pintail bag limit from 1 to 2. Dave, how many pintails do we actually shoot? <laughs> I, I never got to shoot one, right. but that doesn't mean that I'm not sure. <laughs> Some years, it depends on who surveyed, but very few show up on the okay. wing surveys. Um, just casual observations when I was out looking around this year, we had actually a good number of pintails in some of the marshes. I mean, a good number is I've seen pintails here and there. So there's no real number that have it. And then even canvasbacks and redheads were sure. being Are they seen more like a mid-continent burn and into the west? Or not? Central Eastern. flyways. Like, like a black duck is more pretty much an Atlantic flyway burn. Okay, all right. Um, that one, uh, go to two to one that we're allowed to do. We're just trying to be more opportunity for hunters on pentail. All those in favor? So everybody but Greg. Mm -hmm. okay. 11 1. Yep. Um, hold the youth hunting weekend September 29th to 30th. That's our opening weekend, uh, last week of September. Okay, oh, it's no. always been the last weekend. Okay. And then, um, Gosh, you guys dare to vote without Pat Barry being here on this one. Hold the Woodcocks night season October 1 to November 14. Just so you know, we have no ability to hold it earlier in October 1. That was set years ago, and it's always been a gripe. I've had personally other people that, why can't we open it? When we open our small game season, you'll hear that on the board. Usually it's the last Saturday in September. We don't have that option, so we're all proposing to open it as early as we can, which is October 1. Everybody in favor? Okay. It is too bad it couldn't open right. the same day as grouse season. Last year was yeah. only a day earlier. All what I say is I wish I was on council Saturday. when that was done. And I wasn't. I was a student in Maine. Maine kind of drove that. They're the leaders who were talking research. They got what they wanted. I only know because I used to hunt Maine, small game when I was in college. They're small game, so I got to go on. So but that's the way it works. We've got to work this thing. This is super. So we're very little on. Um, anybody got questions anytime, time, reach out to Dave, and we'll, we'll group back in April after we see what the people react to. So, hey, great job. Okay. This is a school. I've seen it come. That was easy. Now we have all this extra time. We do it, and we don't need it. Here are the dogs. Okay. okay. Cedric's going to do a quick presentation. Uh, let me give a quick introduction to something before he does. Actually, I want to have uh, Scott Darling. Oh, Scott, sorry. That's okay. Um, Scott uh, is going to call in. He's actually on vacation this week. But um, I wanted him to be here. What? It's um, important. Uh, this is a little bit different than what the department has traditionally done with proposals um, for the board. Um, the, the commissioner and I made a, a, a very conscientious uh, decision to have this proposal go before you from the big game team, not go through the management team, um, you know, the department. And not that we don't um, change a lot, although there is some leeway. Some of these, some of these seasons that we have, sometimes there is a recreational component, there's an economic component, social part. That's where the management comes into it. As long as we don't, um, you know, make recommendations there beyond what the science could, could tolerate for the species or, or understand. So that's really important um, that you folks understand this. Most of the public has seen this proposal and doesn't understand it. They're sending commissioner emails one way or another, thinking it's his proposal. It's not. This is coming direct from our big game team. Um, have we got Scott on the phone? Scott is ready for you. Okay, good. He's here. So what we wanted to do um, tonight, uh, I assume everybody here got the proposal. Um, we've got some extra copies if you don't. Um, if you want to see that, is uh, Scott's going to, I'm going to ask him as chair of the big game team, and Scott works out of the Rutland office, is to kind of kick this off and um, <coughs> introduce, he'll, he'll probably uh, turn over to Senator for a little while, and most of you met Senator Alexander at <coughs> Moose meetings, which all of you are at. He's been our project leader ever since we've hunted Moose um, here in the Vermont. But I also want to introduce to you, some of you got to meet this young lady at the uh, public Moose information meetings have, is this, uh, Dr. Katie Dieter, um, who's here. Thanks for coming up here today. Um, it's important that I share with you um, Katie's background. 
Um, she came to us, she's a recent hire for our department. Um, I'm going to guess eight months, ten months. I know you went through your oh six my. month probation. How Se close am I? Just about almost seven months. Uh, I'm not so. too far off. I give you a couple extra I'm months. I'm pretty old. All the things you do, I don't know. I'd like to trade places with you. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a faculty mem member at Humboldt State University, has a uh, PhD from Virginia Tech studying climate change and piping plovers. For those inland people, that's a bird on the coast. Um, <laughs> uh, has a master's of science degree from Trent University on shorebirds. Uh, bachelor's of science degree at McGill University. She's worked on mountain plovers, oyster catchers, you might have to explain to them what that is, uh, climate change effects on Hawaii's floor, and wolf fishing. Um, she starts. So, a tremendous background, and I only can say, it, as someone who's been able to see the benefits of her work so far for this department of the wildlife division, a godsend to, to us. From everything we do, from even trying to evaluate and decide what questions we ask from the hunters by a license to all the way down looking at technical information on, on all of our species. And, and I think we're very fortunate to have you, Katie, uh, working with us. One of the things that she's been doing right now is trying to strengthen our relationships with the University of Vermont, our key research faculty that is up there, working with all these species things. Big help on the Lewis Project and, and on and on. So Katie is here um, because uh, you know, significance of moves. And, and we look at this quite serious. And she's been a big part of the big game plan, working under Scott's direction. He's uh, her immediate supervisor. But Katie, you know, please feel free at any time tonight you want to step in and try to explain to us um, some of the modeling or science if questions come up. I want you to feel free to, to, to you know, ask her questions at any time on this. So what I'd like to do is turn it over to Scott and ha have him walk you through the proposal. You there, Scott? I am. Mark. Okay. Could you, could you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Thank okay. You. How about... Did everybody hear Scott? You're, you're a little quiet, Scott. I'm going to try to turn you up here. Yes, you're up all the way. All right. Just try to speak up a little bit. So part two, just before I give you the green light, Scott, here, is um, Lewis and myself will talk a little bit, as we alluded to in the email that I sent you, um, from some of the administrative management issues that we deal with in the department trying to administer the, the moose hunt that we want. So we'll share that with you and try to answer any questions you have as you make your decision um, here tonight. It's really important, i got to emphasize this, that we get a sense whether the board wants to move forward or not with the moose hunt. Lewis and I will talk about that later after the presentation of the game team. Because all of a sudden, you're going to be doing a, a final vote on this in April. And, and uh, we're in trouble if, if all of a sudden you vote something different, quite different, than we think you're going. Because there's a lot of prep and homework that has to be done to administer a Vermont moose hunt um, as we do it right now in the state. All right, Scott, it's all yours. And I really appreciate you on your time off here to, uh, I think you had to drive somewhere half an hour so you get cell phone service. Okay, West Virginia, the hills. All right, it's all yours. All right, it's great. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, anyway, I did want to uh, say start off by saying the big game team, especially Frederick and uh, Katie, have given a new diligence over the past few months. And uh, as you well aware of, uh, this included three public informational meetings that we held in December to begin to explain to the uh, public some of the challenges we're facing with new financial fuel in the North East. Uh, one of the uh, elements is really important you know, in, in our proposal here is that although, uh, as you know, a new big game plan that uh, will be about two years away, and in conducting our evaluation of the staff and we felt that what we need to um, really evaluate the situation prior to uh, the big game planning process. And so, that's why uh, I think we will describe an event in a new income period for managing our new population now. And in that, that process, uh, the big game team really has looked at uh, at least four kinds of evaluation um, in preparation for the public December uh, news meeting. We evaluate the news destinies and WNUs across the state. We also begin to incorporate data from our first year of our new research project in the Northeast. And that was a way as a means of informing our models. Well, we had Katie assist uh, with the data evaluation and taking a look at a lot of our uh, trend data over time. And we also felt we need to pay close attention to the role of new centuries on the world of pitch at the Rodney. And I think we explained that pretty well for those who attended the December meeting. Um, I think one of the key findings that come out of this proposal is uh, 
before you, and Kevin McCreary can provide more details about it. Is that uh, one, we felt that we need to recommend a new mentor to the executive. Um, and you will see those in the upper follow Secondly, uh, we felt we wanted to establish thresholds for when harvesting roots would be proposed. And then those uh, suggested a 75% of the WMU density objectives for two consecutive years. And thirdly, new uh, signing rates in WMU's E1 and E2 appear to be leveling off from their earlier decline, and we view this as a positive outcome that uh, we hope will uh, continue, if not uh, begin to show an increase over time. And, and fourth was, uh, here we looked at the bull cow sex ratios uh, after a uh, few years of some bull only harvesting in, in most of the state, um, and we found that those are only stable at the appropriate level. So in this proposal, much of the attention is now directed at WMU E1 and E2, where new densities are currently at one move per square mile, which is the revised density objective for those units. And we feel uh, strongly that we need to maintain these densities at this level in those two WMUs for a while to see how the water fits respond to those lower densities. Well, I'll close with uh, suggesting that the proposal before you is consistent with um, the need to maintaining those uh, new densities with a limited harvest that has no influence on new population trends in those two different years over the next few years. I would not call this proposal uh, harvest, uh, proposed harvest biologically necessary at this time, with the emphasis being at this time, but I would describe it as biologically sound and consistent with our mission. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeffrey to uh, provide I'll, I'll more details in the uh, proposal. Great, thanks, Scott. Did people hear those bullet points? Because I, I wrote them down as, as Scott said them, and I can repeat them if you, if you didn't hear them. But if you did, I, I'll, uh, I'll leave it as it is and turn it over to Cedric. People hear them okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try to turn off some lights here. Um, is that okay? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, are you still there, Scott? That's important for me to know this. No, I sure am. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so uh, Scott actually covered quite a bit, so uh, I'll, I, maybe I will be quick. I said, said it has a quick delivery time. I don't know what you mean by that. That's good. It's just kind of quick. Uh, but he did cover a lot, so hopefully some of these graphics will help, help it sink in a little bit. So I'm going to... I uh, just quickly review last year's moose season hunting results, some of the highlights, and then <coughs> give an explanation of the 2018 season proposal that you have before you tonight. So just a quick review here, last year the archery season was 17 permits. And, uh, you could see that some of these units just had one in each, and uh, there was only three in E1 and three in E2. So. <coughs> The impact from the archery hunt was basically negligible when you look at the whole state. Um, the regular season, there were 63 permits. Again, compared to what we're kind of grown accustomed to here, these are pretty small numbers. Um, and with about a 60% success rate, uh, not a big impact, but it's still providing hunting opportunity and a lot of happy hunters partook in the season. Uh, so looking at the archery season results, we ended up with 18 permits. One of the auction winners elected to go use his uh, winning bid during the archery season. Uh, eight bulls were taken. That's a 44% success rate. Uh, that was up from last year um, and also above the six-year average. So we've had six archery hunting seasons now. <clears throat> so they did well last year. And moose were taken by archers in six different management units, as you can see there. The regular season uh, ended up with 70 permits when you add in the other four auction winners and three special opportunity permit holders. 
uh, in addition to the 63 that the board authorized. 32 most were taken, and that was a 46% success rate, about the same as the previous year. Uh, both seasons combined produced an estimated six tons of uh, boneless moose meat, or enough for 48,000 quarter pound servings of moose meat. Um, of course, it was bulls only, and there was one cow taken by one of the special opportunity permit holders, because uh, as you recall, the board uh, wanted to give them uh, either sex choice. And, uh, but there were 31 bulls taken, and we got uh, uh, cementum or incisor's teeth from, from those bulls. And this is our age structure from the harvested bulls. Actually, the cow's on here, too, also. Uh, she was a yearling. Um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, we were pleased to see that 23% of the harvested moose last year were yearlings. You might recall the previous year it was uh, very low, the lowest we had all time. So that was uh, uh, very um, satisfying to see that. This is the percentage of yearlings in the harvest through time. And as you can see, that black line shows the trend has been going down. Um, and again, as you might recall from last year, I know a few of you board members are new, uh, but uh, a lot of you came to the three public meetings, so we appreciate that. Uh, but again, we were down to 7% yearlings last year, and uh, that went back up to 23%, which is really the highest it's been for seven years. And these are small sample sizes, so uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the confidence intervals are here. But anyway, it was a positive uh, outcome compared to the previous year. Um, we aren't getting any uh, information from harvested cows, of course, now that it's a bull's only season. I, I did mention that one cow. She was a yearling and she had not ovulated. But in general, we've lost that data set for the time being. Fortunately, because of our new collared moose study that was implemented a year ago, uh, we are getting uh, valuable data up in the study area at least, uh, up in wildlife management units E1 and E2, uh, from uh, the study and especially the calving rates uh, by uh, trying to sneak in on collared cows, cows during the calving season. And so last spring, we had 16 calves that we were able to confirm were born uh, from 30 to 30 cows that were collared. And so that's 0.53 calves born per cow. Um, <clears throat> if you look at some of the results from uh, New Hampshire, for instance, uh, which have higher rates, um, if you look at the percentage of yearlings versus older animals in your collar population, that's going to make a big difference. The board is used to being presented uh, ovulation or calving rates from prime age cows that were harvested by hunters by looking at their, their ovaries. And those are three year old cows and older. With our collared cows, when they're captured, uh, of course it's netty gun, they're net gunned, so they're not immobilized and it's uh, too intrusive to try to jack their jaw open and try to get a look at their proximate age by uh, tooth wear. And so they're not aged. So we don't know how old they are uh, unless they survive, like they've done this, a lot of them have done, and uh, that going into this coming year, the ones that were collared a year ago, we know they're not yearlings. But we really don't know how many of those ones captured last January were yearlings. Um, but we could guess out what they might be and just, if, let's say 10% of them were yearlings. So that, let's say three were yearlings. Uh, and if we ignore those, we could say, well, maybe the calving rate of the older cows was, was 0.59 or maybe 20% were yearlings. And then the calving rate would be 0.67. Again, we don't know how many are two and a half year olds, but probably the numbers of those 30 cows that were collared that were three years old and older, obviously somewhat less than 30, so 
the, the, the calving rate may be quite similar to some of the rates we've been seeing from the ovaries that we've collected in recent years. Could the calving rates be higher with predation could have played roles? Absolutely, that's a good point. Um, we try to visit the cows every two or three days to try to catch that, and but we know we're going to miss some of that. So we did have a pregnancy test done on um, the cows when they're captured, a blood test, um, and there were 19 that tested pregnant. So we might have missed three of them. Um, but it probably wasn't any greater than that. Just another question. Do they, the time of coloring, are they like white tails if they're missing their first estrus, will they come into a heat on a second estrus? Um, yeah, so since they're, they should be bred around mm -hmm. October 1st, uh, by the time we collar in January, it's, they've had plenty of time to cycle twice, actually, if they, if they were going to. Um, the other critical uh, outcomes the smaller animals, of course, is how many are surviving uh, through the winter. And this picture here shows one of the calves that died. There were 12 that died, uh, but 18 survived. So the survival rate is 60%. And we lost three cows, so 27 survived, or 90%. And uh, these calving rates and these survival rates are uh, very valuable for us to input into our moose population model. Uh, we've been using inputs from um, New Hampshire's results over the years and looking at our own age structures and our percentage of yearlings in the harvest, looking at our tick, tick levels when we count moose in the fall. Uh, but to, to have real data from our own moose in this particular part of the state at least we, we know that that's, that's an input that's reasonable for a particular year. This is going to change from year to year based on the level of ticks that are on the moose. We know that. We know that from previous studies in New Hampshire, Maine. And, uh, but still, it's, it gives us an input that we could put in for one year or every three years, um, play around with the model that way. <coughs> Most of these calves especially died from anemia or blood loss and protein, <clears throat> blood volume to tick feeding. Uh, the survival rates of the newborn calves, these ones that we were able to detect that were born last May, ended up being 62%. Uh, so six of the calves that we detected on the landscape with these collared cows died most of them in a couple of weeks. One of them made about a month. Is there a question? Probably an estimate, I won't say it. Um, the other uh, issue that we've been looking at, and again, if you went to the meetings you saw this, but is the fact that the incidence of brain worm, as reported by the warden force when they're handling non-hunting mortalities, moose that are showing class, classic symptoms of brain worm and are eventually die or often may be euthanized if they're in a, a situation where uh, it's causing a human health hazard. That's been going up. And uh, as you can see by this graph, the last five or six years, you know, it's uh, closer to 15% of these non-hunting mortalities have been attributed to brain worm, whereas the long-term average is around 7%. And we do know from other studies elsewhere that when deer densities on the landscape are greater than 10 deer per square mile, that there's often an increase in brain worm, <clears throat> incidence of brain worm mortalities and it can have an impact on the population. And this chart that uh, our deer biologist Nick Ford put together shows in green the areas of the state that have our, our smallest deer densities, our lowest deer densities. Uh, so fortunately uh, for most, at, at least they're at fairly low densities in the Northeast Kingdom, in, uh, management unit E anyway, uh, in some of the mountain zones, or one down here. But pretty much the rest of the state has fairly high deer densities, especially in the more southern parts of the state. Um, 
And so that's where there's been a higher percentage of non-hunting mortalities in those other zones that are attributed to brain work. So even though our tick levels as measured on uh, harvested moose over the last four years have been very low outside of the Northeast Kingdom, uh, our, our moose populations are facing increased brain work. Uh, so the department has uh, initiated certain management actions, especially in recent years, of reducing permit numbers. This is the graph that shows the numbers of permits issued in green and the harvest of moose since the first hunt in 1993 when 30 permits were issued and 25 moose were taken. Uh, we reduced the herd intentionally, uh, starting with very high permit numbers in 2005 or so through 2010, and got it down to where we had around 3,000 moose in the state, we feel, we feel and we're, uh, with, we're able to issue 400 permits, and that was the goal to sort of stay there. Uh, but as you can see by the graph, things kept going down, and we've reacted to the fact that our indices for the moose herd size most of them have been declining year after year. And um, so not only have we come to you with proposals to reduce permit numbers, uh, but we came to you in 2015 uh, to go pretty much bulls only throughout most of the state. And uh, that was the second real major management action that the board has taken. And last year it was virtually bulls only everywhere. Uh, despite that, the population estimate based on the annual deer hunter effort survey uh, has continued to go down. When you look at each individual wildlife management unit, multiply the sighting rate by our regression equation, times the area, and add them all up, it uh, still has gone down through the last several years. However, if you look at uh, sighting rates up in the management unit E, E1 and E2 subunits, as Scott mentioned uh, on the phone here, um, it looks like it's been declining over time, and it has, but if you look at the, just a, a subset of that, the more recent years, and graph that, and these are, these are graphs that Katie put together, um, you can see that it's really has stabilized up there. Last year, we had a point that you know went up from the previous year, and it's gone up a couple times. Um, so if you look at this five or six year period, uh, statistically, it's pretty much leveled off there. But overall, the statewide population estimate is lower. I think maybe by about a thousand moves from what it was last year. Um, the bulls only hunting, we've explained to the board when we first introduced this in 2015, that you're running a risk of uh, altering this adult sex ratio on the landscape. If you keep taking bulls and you, the cows aren't dying at a similar rate, that you could skew the sex ratio so that there might be cows that go unbred because there's not enough bulls to service them. And so we've been looking at this, and this is, again, uh, an analysis that Katie did for us uh, in a graph she put together uh, to show there wasn't any st statistically significant reduction uh, in these, this graph. You can kind of see that visually uh, from the sex ratio shows. Um, one of the real important findings from some of the New Hampshire work and other work that's been done in the Midwest states is this correlation between uh, moose densities on your landscape and observed uh, tick epizootics. And these would be instances where at least 50% of the calves that were born the previous summer don't make it through the winter. And it's kind of arbitrary to call an epizootic at 50%, but that's what we've done here, or what New Hampshire has done. And anyway, that's a 
serious impact to your population growth, obviously, when 50% of the calves don't make it through their first winter. And so they've found a correlation where if, if you have a moose density low enough so that the parasite density remains low, uh, you'll have very little impact on your population growth. Whereas if it's above 1.3 moose per square mile on the landscape, that has often led to these high mortality rates or these epizootics. <clears throat> Up in wildlife management unit E, our estimate right now is 1.05 moose per square mile. And that's based on the rolling three-year average of the last three years of deer hunter effort survey data from deer hunters up in that part of the state. So, as Scott mentioned, the big game team uh, reviewed all this data, and uh, for the time being, we feel we should propose uh, interim target densities, some changes. And the, the major change <clears throat> is to reduce the current target density for management units E1 and E2 in our current 10-year management plan from 1.75 moves per square mile down to one. We'd all like to see 1.75 moves per, um, per square mile on the landscape, but <clears throat> with the current level of ticks out there also, um, we feel it's prudent to, to try to keep that population of moose or the density of moose down to a level where ticks hopefully will um, diminish and not impact the health of the moose as, as much as they are currently. <clears throat> we, we know we've got two more years of data ourselves. There's additional years of data being collected by Maine and New Hampshire. So this observation that 0.75 moose uh, might be a real critical threshold um, might certainly get uh, reevaluated or tweaked. Uh, and so for now, we're proposing to try to keep the moose population basically where it is, at 1.0 moose per square mile. All of the other management units in the state right now are less than 75% of the, these interim target thresholds that we're proposing. And those thresholds vary from 0.25 moose per square mile up to 0.75 moose per square mile. And uh, they, most of those didn't change. We, we had an interim uh, level of 0.25 for management unit G that we proposed a couple years ago. And that led to closing of G because it was below that. Um, and we've suggested that we change that back up to 0.5 to be consistent with the other management units in that uh, the Green Mountain region. But other than that, there's really almost no changes. And so we're before you tonight with this proposed uh, season proposal of uh, 10 permits for the regular season. Um, to be uh, issued um, I got it backwards. I did this at 4 o'clock. So. <laughs> so five permits for the uh, regular season in E1 and uh, five in E2 and then two permits for the archery season in each one of those subjects. <laughs> In all the other units, we're proposing zero permits for this, for this year. Um, as Scott mentioned and, and Mark, we did hold three public meetings to gather comments. Actually, inform the public, there's a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of you came to those. Thanks again for coming to those. Uh, they were held uh, in Charleston, Montpelier, and Woodstock, and we had uh, usually 40 or 50 people in each one of those meetings. Um, and we got a lot of input back from the attendees and some of the major common concerns 
that we heard from the attendees included this list here. Um, obviously, there was a lot of concern about winter ticks, uh, questions about whether pesticides could be used somehow to improve the fate of moose. Are there, were there biological control, controls that might be available? Um, there was concern about climate change and how that was favoring ticks and rainworm, perhaps. Uh, there were a number of comments about habitat, how has it changed, what can the department do to try to facilitate better habitat on the landscape, both on public lands and on private lands. And the questions about why are we still hunting when the moose population continues to decline. Um, we had talked about possible thresholds where uh, we might issue zero permits. Some people were, had questions about exactly what, the, what those might be. And uh, there were concerns expressed at two of the meetings about big maple, in other words, large industrial type maple syrup operations that have uh, showed up on the landscape in the last few years and how, how most do fare with those on the landscape. And uh, down at the Woodstock, I think was the only meeting where I remember hearing concerns about bear predation, uh, I guess mostly on calves. Um, so we, we really didn't have the thresholds established or we hadn't really discussed much what we might do for this tonight proposal to you until those meetings were over. And, uh, we certainly uh, considered uh, the input that we got at those meetings. Uh, we know from those meetings, and uh, I know the commission and other folks in the department have heard from hunters that uh, whether they're in the kingdom or elsewhere aren't seeing as many moves. Uh, so we didn't feel there was any real strong push to continue hunting elks uh, throughout the state, but we feel biologically that we can sustain a hunt up in Wildlife Management Unit E and provide those meals and those experiences and still have uh, moose on the landscape for non-hunting uses or enjoyment uh, and try to keep our density where it is now for the time being, especially until we can reevaluate this in a couple of years. So I guess we can turn the lights on. Great. Thanks. Thank Scott, did you want to add anything more? No, I don't, Mark. Uh, I think Senator did a great job. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, questions, folks, uh, for what Senator's presented? <clears throat> Are you running this? I, yes. Are we doing a. Uh, First vote on this proposal tonight, or is this more of a well, we're gonna, information? What we're going to ask you to do is weigh in on whether to issue permits and, and whether to proceed to the public hearings with this proposal or with no permits. Well, I personally support this proposal. I think this is right on target, uh, especially with one of the last presentations in there. <coughs> It makes sense to manage the moose for somewhere around one per square mile and not allow them to get up to that 1.30. The only thing I am a little concerned about is just you know, skewing the ratio of bulls and cows, like Cedric uh, mentioned, but also not having any reproductive data. We aren't going to know the weights of mature cows, uh, we aren't going to have the reproductive data from the ovaries that hunters turned in and so forth. So I'm a little concerned with that, but I am in full support with the pro pro proposal as presented. I think there's a there's concern about the numbers. Uh, even if at 50% harvest, talking seven moose, they say this last year there were four accidents that we responded to on 242 Westfield J, and all four of those were bulls, and all four were killed. 
Um, so that's just four moose right there alone that were killed by car accidents. So, as you heard from Scott and Cedric, it Seven. won't make uh, it won't make any difference to the population either direction in all likelihood at this permit level. We're not going to influence the population to grow, particularly with bulls only. We're not going to influence the population to grow. We're not going to decrease it from what it would be without a hunt. Okay, number four, it says the annual auction when special opportunities permit were introduced. So I'm going to have to give one for that. Yes. That doesn't come out of the 14. Come in it. Wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to make sure we can answer your question clearly. The one permit for the auction, if that's what we get, comes out of that 14. Okay. So that lowers it to no, 13. Yes. It's not yeah. addition. Yeah. I asked you folks that. Well, I, I must have misinterpreted you or answered so you. you want it, you, so you're recommending 15 permits? How many? 19 permits? No, no. Well, the auction is in addition to what the board approves to the regular process. <coughs> right. Then the next question, it says the first five permits go to, in the lottery for veterans. Does yes. that come out of the 14? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's so then there's only nine permits for the general public. Uh, well, the veterans are part of the general public. They just get well, two, yeah, two cracks at a small part of it. Uh, plus, if the board uh, opted to do special opportunity permits, it would come out of that as well. Okay. So the only one that's added would be the auction permit? No. no the special opportunity the permits are in addition to... I guess my question, Scott, would be, what's the maximum number of moose hunting permits that the big game team recommends? Well, you know, we've done all of our analyses with the, uh, the 14 permits, and uh, maybe Katie knows whether we've thrown the one auction in there. I don't know. Um, and so I, I, I guess I would yield to you know, those numbers for what we feel comfortable with at this time. Katie, do you want to respond at all? Um, well, if it's a matter of only one or, or two extra bulls, then it doesn't make a difference in the overall trends of the population. It's because you're dealing with bulls only and you're not really, if you're taking away, you know, cows, then that has a much bigger impact on the trends um, than it does for bulls. So I think I was only seeing a slight um, change in the population trends at like close to 20 bulls. I mean, you really had to up those numbers and you had to up them consistently from year to year. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So, Pete, okay, is your question answered? I, I want to make sure you're clear on that. I was concerned about the veterans. That, that's not five just for veterans. Yeah, that's that statute. Yeah. Out of the 14. So, out of the 14. Yes. Right. If, if, if the board, let's say they authorize five permits, then someone who's not a veteran, assuming we have at least five veterans that apply, there wouldn't be any left over. Right. They come out of your allocation. Special opportunity permits are only if you get requested. Last year, I don't think we had any Vermont hunters. I think they all came from out of state. Um, and it's, it's uh, is it the commissioner or the board? The, the board. 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 But the auction is uh, the, the number of the auction. I know that. I, the statute, I think, says up to up five. Up to five. Up to five. So, and okay. it's been interpreted by our attorney that we probably would have to do at least one. Right. Mm -hmm. But who makes that decision on the one to five? We can check that question. I'm not sure. I think it's the commissioner. Commission. I mean, it's the commissioner. Well, you got the statute there. Yeah. And if it's not you, it would be the board. Yeah. So that's yeah. certainly uh, something you can do. Want to think about and maybe advise it. So the auction tag is part of the four right gun tags, right? That would. What's it or is the? It's an either or. They have the options. Yeah, it's an either or. Oh, it's either or. Whatever they want. They could hunt either one. Okay, so that only leaves. And lately, seven for the. the auctions in addition to this proposal. Okay, so that's 
So, okay. so, so what would be the final number of permits? That's 15. what I really want to know. 15. 15. 15. 15 is what? If you need at least 15, and when would we know when the commissioner would make that decision whether you can do one or five? Well, I can tell you right now, I would only recommend one. one. Okay. okay. So out of the 14, not counting the auction, what would be Five by statute goes to veterans. So then we're down to nine general public. And then if you choose, so we're down to nine. And if you choose to do special opportunity. And then that would be. So the special opportunity would be the uh, hunt of a lifetime. Of a lifetime. Okay. And we have no option of adjusting the five on the uh, veterans. Exactly. Never. Yeah. We have no option. Yeah. Well, one other piece of, of information for the board is uh, we've done a quick look at what it costs us to run a moose season, and it's about $37,000 um, to do a moose season. We don't know exactly what the, what the season would bring in, but I would guess it would be something along those same lines. Probably the half of the moose water you think it brings in. Uh, no, that's counting that in. Uh, we had our chief financial officer, Steve Gomez, look at all this. Or since we give us his best estimates, and we read numbers, he figured financially the season would be about a wash. And that doesn't include biological staff working on it, law enforcement staff working on the seasons, support staff answering questions, all that stuff that goes into to managing the season. But that's what, and his best guess was that that would probably looking at a projection of uh, 1,750 resident applications, given the numbers of 14 or 15, and 1,050 non-resident applications. But I'm not sure of the non-resident, because I think we issue, Senator can correct me, but up to 10% of the permits go to non-residents, so that means only one permit. So I'm not sure how many non-residents would apply for them. I have no idea. But he based it on previously um, projections of how the applicants have gone down in relation to the number of available permits. So, so what the board is is really facing is not a biological question. Uh, it's the question of, of opportunity, limited amount of opportunity for a, hunt for a few permits, or opting not to have permits on a on a uh, on the moose population given where it stands and given other other factors. Can you gather any biological data that's meaningful off of non-hunting mortality cows? Can you get to those carcasses soon enough to gather any good data? Sure. Can you up I'll, that, I'll can you up Cedric, that effort to yeah. compensate? Pardon? Can you up that effort to compensate for what you're not getting? She wasn't a plant. <laughs> Is George still here? Yeah, um, you know, we have, we have cards for dealing with road kills and stuff where, you know, we'd like to have the fetus counts this time of year. So it would be good to get the statute does get those more often. Uh, and yeah, there's there's things we can we can up that. You're right. You know, so we have, can fit it in with the other stuff. I'd like to see it increase. But that's still assuming there's a small number that continues to show up and there has been a small number every year so there's only so much you can surmise about a total population when you're only getting four, five to ten individuals which is why this new study is it's more than just looking at colored moose it's also looking at ways to test pregnancy rates using urine and you know, to, to look at other indices of, of moose um, and measuring biological things from you know, you're really trying to increase our ability to tell what's going on. So. Yeah, you know, talking about non-hunting, um, voice mortality, I'm, I'm still blown away that 52% of the mortality is from, you know, vehicle-related incidents. And I'm even more fascinated by the fact that winter ticks is, like, barely 1% of that. So it's, I'm kind of, it's kind of, like, weird, like, looking at the table mortality, it's like, you know, to have this many collisions just seems to tell you that there's still a good population of moose still out there on the landscape, regardless of winter ticks, and accounting for mortality through hunting. So, well, um, keep in mind that we're 
we're more likely to see the non-hunting mortality from cars. Yeah, I mean, I'm just blown right. away by that. Yeah. It's just like an astounding number. Right. Like, even when you factor in how many moves are actually taken through hunting. Um, but I am curious, what is this other cause of death? Um, what, what do you mean by other? Like, what uh, constitutes Well, that? just because there's kind of a limited number of columns to put on a page, but uh, falling off a cliff. Hit, hit by a train. Well, the train we actually flew with more vehicles. Cool. Um, you know, all this, yeah. yeah. But it's stricken by lightning, uh, drowning. Um, Getting whacked by a tree, right? And then impaled by a tree. That's happened before. Uh, Are there management right? permits for moose doing damage? Uh, and they would be there also. We didn't have one last year, I don't believe. But some years has been as many as three. Yeah. What happened to those moose anyway? Like if somebody gets one of those permits. They have to be um, processed when the warden gives permission to the landowner. And if the landowner can't deal with it or doesn't want it, they have to find somebody that will, right? Yes. Go yeah, ahead the and land, yeah, landowner gets first preference, but after that, they can't find somebody. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. But that is something that does still occur. Yes. I mean, we, I don't think, I, I think I ran the numbers for somebody last week, I can't remember who it was, one of the biologists, and I don't think we had any for 2017 moose killed doing damage. No, I don't think so. Um, not that I, not that I recall, I ran all of them. I might, there might have been one or two, but I don't recall anymore. You know, on another side note, um, looking at the uh, table of deer hunter surveys for moose, you know, I'm happy to say that my husband and I both contributed to spotting moose during this year behind our place in Underhill. And it's been a great pleasure to actually witness a moose on a very regular basis out behind our house, so close to um, Burlington and civilization. So it's really fun. The um, scouting reports, this is from the people that, heard, people that had the permits? Is that where these are coming from? Uh, the moose? Yeah. Yes, that's right. I just B and C look like the... Uh, only four moose seen, and I can share some trail cameras of well in excess of four moose. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not many hunters to begin yeah. with, okay. and this is, you know, I think we got about 55% return on the surveys. Okay. Um, uh, I'm okay. I have a couple of biological questions. Great. <laughs> so, because of the the impact of bull hunting only. When you notice your survival rate versus bull versus cows, even there like the tick load, does one seem to survive more than the other? Yeah, good question. Um, when a moose rubs up against a clump of larval ticks, they all come onto the animal. And <clears throat> If you weigh two or three times as much as a calf, you're going to be able to withstand the blood loss a lot better than the calf. And so it's much more debilitating to the calves. And their, their mortality rate, as we saw and as the other studies have seen, is always much higher than the cows. We lost three cows. One probably died of brain worm, or did die of brain worm. Um, so two did. Had, were debilitated by ticks. Um, bulls, uh, and we'll we'll get to know this ourselves in time because we have we capture calves that are males, and uh, going into this first winter they're going to be yearling males, and um, so we'll see how many all survive. But yeah, I guess we'll, I'd, I'd be more uh, likely to want to know what. I mean, adult cows and adult bulls, which one's more likely to survive? Or how do you the, the bulls are, when you're talking about deaths by ticks, but going into the winter, the bulls might be in, in poor condition because of the rut okay. or injuries they received in fighting. Right. Um, so we have considered Cow, cow survival higher than bulls, typically. But if you have a bad tick here, it, it could change that. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out whether, you know, hunting bulls only, if you're losing more cows to the tick load anyway, if it'll help level itself out. That's 
you know, we thought we, we, we wondered the same thing. And uh, so my other, might. yeah, my other question is, has there been any thought by the department about seeing how we're at this level we're at now with the moose population about either moving the season forward or back to make sure that the cows are being bred before we're killing them, killing the, you know, the bulls that we're allowing to kill? Well, I think we felt all along that by starting at the third Saturday in October, that most of the breeding has, has occurred since the peak is October 1st. And that's a photo period thing. So uh, that doesn't really change. And I think too, Cedric, uh, we would might be concerned about that if we were seeing a sex ratio get skewed. But since we're not, that wouldn't be as much of a concern, correct? Because there's still plenty of bulls out there in proportion to the cows. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think Lewis already gave the answer to this, but I'm going to repeat it again. So other than the initial take of the say you killed, I don't know, 50% of the 14 bulls, there'll be no impact on the herd as it stands. You know, biologically, I might say virtually no impact. Right? It says no, no biological impact. So you're losing some animals. Right. But as you're recruiting. The important animals are the females. They're the ones that make new ones. And as long as you have enough bulls out there to service the females, right. there's there's really no biological impact with such a small number of permits. Okay. You know, when we had 30 permits in 1993, that we considered very conservative, but it was the first hunt, so we wanted to be <coughs> conservative. And we didn't expect it to have any real impact on the herd. And we had fewer moose now, then than we do now. Right. Yeah, to put it into perspective, it's a difference of over five years, about 0.4 moose per square mile, which if you think about it, those moose could have died from other factors and the, the model has no way of incorporating those other random factors that could be, you know, hundreds of things. So that it's really the trends from year to year. And the trends from year to year are driven by how many calves are produced and how they survive. So, so and I got one last question. And seeing how the climate change expert is here, I'm going to direct it to Katie. So, um, do you, uh, let's see, I'm not going to say this. So would you say that, the, obviously, I think it's been put out there that the tick load now that we're having is due to climate change or not getting the cold temperatures? Would you agree with that? Well, that's what, I haven't studied that personally, but that's what the previous research has been coming to the conclusion of because they're seeing, and you know, there has been a link made to shorter winters that you have, the shorter duration of your winter, and the less snow you have when those ticks fall off in, in the springtime, that's when you get more and more frequent epizootic. So instead of an epizootic every eight years, now you're seeing an epizootic every three to four years. And that's what's really thought to have an effect on the moose population. Because when we try to model you know, an increase in the population, it really has an effect if you see like two consecutive good years for moose. You know, if they're really only out calves and those calves are surviving one year, that's great. But then if they survive again and have another good year the next year, that really puts them up the, on the upswing. And with these frequent epizootics, they just keep, you know, hammering them every few years. And that's what's really preventing them from increasing. That's the general consensus that's been found so far. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, would you? <laughs> Because of the climate change, would you say that's the effect of more ticks in the state rather than a lack of red fox? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I can't say without more study. Different ticks. Yeah, different ticks. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell that climate change question, and that's why, that's why we're doing this study, because it would be really helpful to know what that threshold is, first of all. Is it 0.75 that we're seeing here compared to what has been found in New Hampshire? Um, that would really help us to understand further how these ticks are affecting them every year. 
I was just kind of commenting, I guess. Um, I've noticed just in my own observations and people near me who have found moose dead in the spring that some of the moose that are dying from ticks seem to be dying in late April or even early May after the weather has improved and we don't have the deep snow anymore and perhaps we're getting toward bare ground and we aren't getting the uh, extreme temperatures at night but I had one two or three years ago that walked by a trail camera and died about 25 yards from the trail camera on you know, over our camp and th then the next 46 pictures are all coyotes. I guess it's kind of an observation if the moose are dying from ticks that late in late April and in early May, I would presume that the ticks survived even though the moose didn't and produced another generation of parasites. I would much rather see more harvest in the fall where those moose are utilized and end up in somebody's freezer instead of producing another generation of ticks and dying in late April or early May on the landscape. Well, Cedric, I was just kind of curious, um, go back to bulls and, and tick lows. Do you, do you suspect that wallowing might have an effect on fewer ticks and why bulls can handle them more? Just like just the general behavior? Well, we feel they handle them more because they're they're just much bigger with a, their yeah, blood volume much. is twice or three times out of a calf. Um, and so the numbers of ticks end up being the same uh, on the animals. And so proportionally, they can handle it. And, they, and, you know, again, we haven't had adult bulls collared yet. We've had one study, yep. one year. We're going to have yearling bulls carrying collars this year because we collared them as calves. But, but the other studies done in New Hampshire, Maine, they actually were capturing all kinds of moose initially, including yep. adult bulls. And they stopped capturing adult bulls because they, they had very few dying of, of tick bulls. And, and Pete, Dr. Peekins has done the energetic work to model the amount of blood loss and you know, whether or not that should kill a bull moose. You know, the model shows it should in most cases. Yeah. Um, and also thinking on, about New York, I mean, New York's got quite a moose population starting. And any, I think it's like, what, four to 600? Moose now in the Adirondacks. Do you have any indication from New York biologists on if ticks are affecting those at that higher elevation? They don't have the tick issues yet. Um, Interesting. Probably because they don't have the densities yet to really create much of a tick issue. Yeah. I'm missing elevation wise too. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know the elevation really does much um, make much of a difference. Well, other than snowpack layer, but, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it was just yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, I just didn't know if there's anything. Yeah, you know, if the snow is state. if the snow is persisting into May and the adult females fall off in April, then they they aren't going to survive as well. The adult female takes. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, adult survival in in previous studies going back, you know, ten years or so, but even in more recent studies in New Hampshire, they've always been finding around 90% survival for yeah. cows and, and bulls. Um, yeah. And so the amount of ticks, the amount of bulls and cows that die from ticks is really quite low compared to cows, where their survival rate could be up, you know, 40% or something. Yeah, and, and then the, the impact on the ability for the cow to bring her calf or calves through that last trimester Yep. Mm -hmm. and not have a stillborn or resorption and mm -hmm. to have a healthy calf born and one that's in, to be lactated at appropriate levels. So that's, that's all, that's all impacted. Mm -hmm. yes. Are the collars somehow adjustable so they grow with the calf or do you have to recapture the calf and readjust the collar as they grow? Thinking about lactating animals. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> they actually, so the calf collars, are doubled folded back on themselves and tied with surgical tubing and then duct taped with a 
particular weight of duct tape that uh, the late states and New Hampshire and Maine have determined will degrade and basically rot off by the next fall. And that allows the collar to expand up to the size to accommodate a growing moose's neck. And, um, and of course, you don't want the collars to fall off when you spend all this money to capture them and put it on there. It's, it's, and so this is all, luckily, we aren't the first doing this. So we, we've really benefited from all this trial and error that's been done by other provinces and states. But great question. Yeah, they're actually, most of the time, they're very loose. They end up being quite loose, not, not to fall off, but because they're morphology, they end up kind of knocking very chin a lot for that loose in the ground. Okay, any more questions? Two. Two. Um, I'd like to see your number stay at 14, period. If you have to have one for an auction, fine. It goes down to 13. And if you're doing a special opportunity, it goes down to 12 for your veterans and permit holders. So, any way you want to work that, that's 14. Second thing is, uh, I'll mention it early on, so you can be thinking about it. If you're doing all this work on putting collars on, are you going to put some kind of notice out to these people that are going to get permits? Don't shoot the bulls with collars on them. Just like we do for bear, don't shoot cubs. Well, um, <clears throat> We had one of our collared bull calves that did slip a collar this fall. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, it got caught on something and came off. And uh, it didn't move, so six hours later it sends out a mortality. Moment. Yep. So, Jake DeBow, who I think you've all seen, you know, he's a master student at UVM, went out with our seasonal wildlife technician and uh, we're pleased to find that it was a slip collar. And we ended up de redeploying that on a cow, so we actually collared an additional cow this past January, which has really given us the important data. Yeah. So because New Hampshire and Maine have already done the bull work, we're, we'd almost rather have that collar come back to us. And um, so if a hunter happens to shoot a bull moose, that would be a yearling. Well, it could be, uh, this coming fall, it could be a two-year-old. Um, we, don't, we don't feel any reason to restrict their, restrict them on that. We'd but like you to get the collar back. I don't know if we own it or not. But, but that yearling, you won't know whether or not he would have made it through the winter with tick load. If Hunter kills him in October. That's true. That's true. Uh, but there's probably going to be enough that aren't going to be killed that we will learn something. And because it's already been kind of proven, now you can never, you can always prove more or better, you know, with bigger samples and more trials. But, you know, up to this point, the department feels like. Uh, you know, we did we, we discussed it obviously because la last fall we had we had yearling bulls out there that could have had legal antlers, probably did have legal antlers. You know, mm -hmm. We felt you know, it's, there's no reason uh, to restrict that, and uh, none of them were taken, as it turned out. All right, I know, I know we're only talking about this up here right. and, and not not the rest of the state, so I know. 14 bulls aren't going to melt through <clears throat> in the snow, so as far as the state's concerned. But I will have to tell four guys in my area they can't hunt the bull down on Route 12. Well, He's a hummer, too. Well, that's up to you. <laughs> There's no permit. <laughs> Any other questions? So I guess the question to you guys, and 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 uh, I'll just echo what Mark said, and just say that you know, obviously, if you were to do something here and then change it uh, 
after the hearings, after our second round of hearings, and as we move through the process, we'll make it work. But it would be very, it would pose a real challenge for us if, if you did that. So we're really asking for a vote for guidance on whether to issue permits in 20, for 2018 or not. One other thing. It sounds like if you don't have a season, the department will save money. Uh, I think it's about a wash. Yeah. Well, it's a wash for that, but then you get law enforcement and all that extra added in there. We, we put the time and effort into other things. Yeah. Uh, the bulk of that cost staff to it's us, staff. too, is, mm -hmm. is our technical IT people that we pay for their time, so we probably have them working on other projects. Okay. There is a printing cost that we would save some money on and do that, but, but you know, we're not posing the question that to stop moose hunting. Yeah. The question is, how many permits from zero to 14, 15, whatever you, know, you want to do? But that's if we vote to not have, to, to not issue any permits this year, mm -hmm. what happens to people's preference points? We would maintain them, freeze them in place. Mm -hmm. That was asked. <clears throat> that question was asked. How much flack do you think you're going to get if we don't have a moose permit and then two years from now try to reinstate it? Uh, well, uh, let me think how to put this. <laughs> um, I think we'll get a lot. I think we'll get a lot of flack no matter what we do. It's well, I understand that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we 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 are in the we are in the business of trying to satisfy 630,000 people, and that's a, not yep. possible. I, I will say this: uh, I think we will have an easier time issuing permits in two years, or one year, or three years. Uh, if it if it's a no permit by a board action, then if it's a legislative directive to eliminate the moose season from the statutes, mm -hmm. not saying oh, yeah. that would happen, but we will technically have a moose permit, a moose season still on the books, and just no permits issued. Is that get at what you're driving at? Yeah, I do. Yep. I'd just like to say I think. I, I appreciate the recommendation because it's consistent with the conversations we have about any of those permits when there are certain units that don't don't see a change in their population size regardless of, of the small number of permits that are issued to take them you know out of that unit and what it does is you know, I've had, I had this conversation last time with, with Nick but you know it, it, it tries to reinforce the fact that we can harvest the resource and and use it, and yet not cause any you know ill effects to it. Um, so if we can harvest from it, you know, it, it, it's my feeling that we should we should do so. Hunters are the tool to manage these moose um, to keep the population down, and and that can be reinforced during this you know at this time. But that's you know that's the way I feel. And if uh, you know it's you've got um, new management goals. You know, interim management goals and, and hunters shouldn't be kept out of that um, process. They should be used to achieve those goals. Well, I think you make a good analogy. It's a little bit like archery and E, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, sorry. I'm still going to take my chances in my car, I guess, based on yeah. the data. <laughs> 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 right? Yeah. My chances of hitting one are better than getting one hunting, so. Real one. Sweet. <laughs> If you get a call from her, you know what it's about. We swerved in the other lane. <laughs> we should be in these vehicles. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, I'm going to uh, say one quick comment. Um, it is really, my personal feeling, it's really not the board's concern whether the department makes money or spends money on this moose season. That's always been, money has never been, supposed to not play a role in our decisions. Um, it's the health and utilization of, of a wild resource. So again, that's that's my two cents on that. And if you lose money, okay, you make money. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a big deal when you were making, you know, the department was making lots and lots of money. So again, 
um, that really shouldn't be a concern. Uh, if we find those, it shouldn't be a concern. So what we need to decide is um, there's been a proposal to have uh, from Bill to have 14 permits total regardless and that would be we would divvy up the um, special opportunity permit out of that and also um, the auction permit out of that so it would bring us down I just have one on the special opportunity see how you brought it up is will that be bold or Said, that's that's up to the board. You would have to uh, last year you opted, uh, we recommended bowl only, and you opted to do either right. size. And they did choose to take one out of three and took a cow. Um, so we're back, to, we're thinking 12 permits. So one special opportunity, one auction, if we choose to do the special opportunity. Um, and five by statute goes to veterans. So we're looking at seven permits going to the general Where would that special opportunity happen? In E1 and 2 or anywhere yeah. in the state? Well, that's also that up to you. Up oh, but I would, I would yeah. our, our strong, yeah. strong recommendation would be in E1 and 2. I have a question. So, given the very low numbers of permits, um, have you ever thought about giving people a choice? Archery versus fire. Well, the success rate in archery is different than fire. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's lower. It was about it was almost yeah. even slash. Yeah, I I I don't know what Cedric thinks about that. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, and it would actually yeah. incidentally solve one issue for us, which is we are concerned yeah. about collecting uh, applications from archery hunters and then them not having any opportunity and any actual chance of winning mm -hmm. yeah. given the low number of permits. So it would solve that issue. I, I wouldn't have an issue with it. Uh, law enforcement, anything? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people out there that are applying are, are kind of might be both types of hunters anyway. I mean, that's kind of a bad statement, but. Well, I think uh, we, we would ask that they identify which they were going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's. It's funny because we've kicked around this issue with the archery permits in the department and we hadn't thought of that idea. Mm -hmm. so, Where would you contemplate for the season? When would it open? It would be the same seasons, I would say. If you're claiming an archery tag, you hunt the archery season. And a gun tag, you hunt the gun season. You wouldn't want them, well, I don't, so, know, I don't know if I'd want them out at the same time. But, but you could hunt archery equipment during the gun season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the difference is, is that they're, the bulls are they're more vocal and they call in easier, and that's why you're limited on your gear with archery. I think they'd be more vulnerable with a gun. I think you'd have a higher success rate hunting during that prime prime time with a gun. Yeah, I agree. I think it would go with the season dates. You, you'd have to pick. Yeah. So I'll just comment that <clears throat> I know, you know, you have 15 permits, whatever it might be, we're, we're thinking maybe 10 months would be the average, but, and only s maybe s seven or eight during the rifle season. So it's a small number of moves, but it's still we'd be getting October larval tick counts. And hopefully that will grow over time, which <coughs> we don't do them during bow season because it's not comparable. Um, you know, from one year to the next. And, and there's a lot of questing going on during the running season. Mm -hmm. So by doing those counts the third Saturday in October, uh, we're getting a, a, a snapshot in time that uh, we, we all know that the questing period has been going later many falls, but at least it's a consistent number that we can compare with New Hampshire because their season opens the same day. In, in Maine, when Maine, when we look at their larval tick counts on their animals, we deal with their October season also, same time period. So anyway, that's just one consideration. Yeah. And um, again, it's a, may seem negligible at this point, but it is a number of animals, and you know, maybe increasing in future years. So anyway. Yeah. What are the actual season dates? Like? We choose to do archery and then we choose to do archery. Archery is always October 1st. Yeah. And 
whatever the third Saturday in October is, because the, the regulation says that it should be the third Saturday in October. Um, so I know there was an issue in the comment regarding the staffing. What do you mean? Well, if we, you know, reporting and all of that. So if we had archery and rifle all be the exact same time. Like during the approach season? Uh, no, I, I think we would still, we would recommend split a split season, split season split. still to, and people choose which implement and which season they want to participate. But I just want to say that this is all things we'll come back to you uh, on and thank you for the idea. We'll, yeah. we'll come back on a couple of possibilities for your for your vote. The, the important thing for us to figure out tonight is if you, you want to issue uh, permits. So I just hope, so if we are going to be able to pick which season and which implement, we're all going, everybody's going into the same draw. It would be one draw instead of two, right? Right, so yeah. is that what we're all kind of half thinking instead of archery guys? Yeah, that's like, something we have to, to sort of yeah, think through because yeah. you guys, the way it's set up now is you get archery bonus points. So you, you get rifle right, 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 right. bonus right. points. Yeah. So we yeah. Right. It's an interesting idea. I'm just not sure. Like, yeah, we have to figure out the logistics. It's not like a good idea at the time. It does. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. They could just they could just declare what they wanted if they were drawn. If you got drawn for a moose permit, then you have the opportunity to declare if you were going to write 100 votes. It seems like that'd be that easy. And if there's only going to be 14 or 15, it's a matter of an administrative thing. Just call in the office and we could do that. Not saying what well, not. Right, but what about the thing with the separate the preference, separate preference yeah. points? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you're, point you're, paying, right. you're paying for two, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. have more of those discussions, George. Never mind. <laughs> no, sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a straw vote. And it's going to be a yes. It's going to continue with the new season. Uh, as of right now, we're talking 14 permits, and the no would be to suspend it for a season. Any questions? And there's also yeah. abstaining to get to. 14 permits plus one, or 14 total? Well, I, we'll come back to you on that. I mean, we, we, we'll come back to you with several options okay. yep. um, for your actual yep. vote on the. Yep. Um, this is to give us guidance, and, and we would be approaching things differently, you know, significantly differently if there were going to be zero permits or. Okay. Or something. Yep. Good. So around what will happen is the echo. What will happen is if the board votes affirmative for any number of permits beyond zero, we will be having to set the wheels in motion. Right. Working with the IT people, the permit people, printing applications, getting everything, a press release, all this stuff out there so that hunters can start applauding. But, um, but my expectation, based on this conversation, would be 14 total. Okay. Yeah. Everybody pretty much agree with and, and no permits would be received until after your formal vote. Right. Correct. Yes. In April. That's right. where we'll go from the website. Correct. We're going to announce to the public so they come to the meetings that you'll hear and tell them what we're doing. We can't wait till April to do all that in-house work. Yep. That's the dilemma. Do you have any idea what questions you would want us to ask or you'll be asking the public to comment on? Yeah, on, on these permit numbers. On the permit numbers. Yeah. Yep. Just yep. the permit numbers. Okay. Yeah. Well, probably very similar to what you've done in the past. If you, okay. Even if you issue recommend zero permits, that's, we'll be asking them. The answer, you know what I mean? That's whatever the permit numbers come on a nice meeting. That will be what we want to get public input on. Okay. And that the next time, once we do a formal vote, we can decide if we want to yeah. have the special opportunity permit for a yep. on okay. the If we wanted to have it statewide or just E1 and E2. Correct. Yes. Because we could have that as an option if we chose to. Record more. And then, like last year, we did either. Okay. Any other? What are you thinking? Everybody pretty good on this? Okay. So we're going to do a straw vote. And yes, would be to continue with the 2018 moose hunting season. So all in favor of the 2018. Second on that. 
Bill, your motion. Yeah, Jean Farrell's motion. Yeah. Bill, get a second. I'm sorry. Tim, we got it. Okay. I will. Yeah. Okay. My bad. So, all right. Okay. All in favor? Do you want us to do an I or a yes? Do you want to just because this is just actually a straw vote? Yeah. Okay. You don't need a motion for a straw. Well, that's what I was saying. Yeah. No. All right. We got it. <laughs> all right. Okay. All in favor of 2018 moose season? Say yes. 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 All is opposed. Abstain. Okay. We shall continue with 2018 moose okay. season. All right. <clears throat> okay. Well, that was pretty loud. Okay. Next item on the agenda. Okay. Room meeting calendar discussion. Well, I think we had that already. Okay. We're doing commissioner. Scott, thank you so much for all of Thank you. You're up. Um, Thanks, Scott. He's still there. He's gone. He was playing. A few things for us. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, annual meeting is in Burlington this year. Uh, April what? 15th, 16th, 17th? 15th. Um, if, if any of you are interested in more information on that, just reach out to Susan or to I and or to Tom, and, and we'll get it to you. Um, this is the this is the northeast section of uh, of, the, of our organization of all the fish and wildlife agencies, and uh, be 400, 500 people in Burlington uh, for that for a couple of days. So that'll be that'll be good. Um, our uh, our budget for fish and wildlife uh, is in the house right now, in good shape. We're getting got a slight increase in our general fund, about a two percent, two and a half percent increase in our general fund, uh, and that's looking like it's in good shape. Uh, we had a miscellaneous, have a miscellaneous uh, fish and wildlife bill, which does a bunch of technical, uh, more or less technical changes to fish and wildlife law. Added to that has been three parts um, by the legislature. The first part was uh, on nuisance trapping. It would have required a new nuisance trapping training reporting system. Uh, the Trappers Association and we asked the committee to change that to just require that nuisance trappers are licensed trappers, uh, and that's and that's fine. Um, and that went through that in that in that fashion through the house. Uh, then there are two pieces of that bill that we're concerned about. Um, uh, both uh, uh, both exist in the house version, which went through preliminary approval today. One would allow landowners who post by permission only to get a landowner preference in the antlerous lottery. We oppose that because we're concerned that landowners will just post by permission only and not give any permission, and it eliminates our one tool uh, for uh, for doing that. That was proposed by Representative Paul Fave uh, from the Northeast Kingdom uh, on the committee. The other piece is a, a ban on on coyote hunting contests. Um, you know, I think coyote contests can make sportsmen and women look kind of bad, but I also don't think that we should outlaw everything we don't like. Uh, there are things that, that happen out there that you know certain people, me included, necessarily don't necessarily like, but I'm not sure those should be outlawed. More concerning is that the legislature put that section into the big game threatened and endangered species penalty uh, section. So that's uh, th up to a thousand dollar fine and up to 60 days in jail. Now, we all know that, that in our fish and wildlife crimes, rarely does anybody see jail time. Uh, but the more concerning thing for me is that that's a signal that the legislature uh, considers violation of that to be the same as intentionally killing threatened or endangered species or violating big game laws. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. So we'll keep working on that bill as it goes to the Senate. Um, we're also working on a bill dealing with ATV use. Uh, the governor asked me to take a look at ATV uh, usage and laws and try to make it more accessible to use ATVs. Also to make ATVs and more riders more accountable and, and uh, to improve enforcement. So that bill would make a number of changes. Um, probably most significant ones are it would require uh, helmet insurance uh, uh, and would require a, a statewide speed limit for use on public roads or public land. 
Uh, it would also allow the Secretary of Natural Resources to open connector trails on ATV for ATVs on, on ANR state land, um, which we've tried to do before by rule. Uh, and a uh, few other changes. One of the important pieces in that bill from our perspective, from my perspective, is it would allow us to do safety checkpoints uh, like we do on snowmobiles. So rather than, uh, rather than pursuing an ATV, we would just block the trail and everybody came through and get checked like you do on a snowmobile. Um, I uh, had the first hearing on that, on that uh, bill yesterday and today. Uh, I think it's fairly positive. Uh, we'll, we'll try to move that forward, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll enter into a system, I hope, uh, through this bill in which uh, ATV use is more accepted and also more, uh, more accountable, more, more, uh, more held to account. Um, we'll see, see how that goes. What I can tell you is that the current system of roughly half or less of ATVs being registered and even fewer of those belonging to VASA does not have enough people paying into the system to pay for trails and enforcement. Um, and partly that's because people don't have places to ride. So we can kind of work on ride on vast trails. Not on vast trails. No, no, I was just saying we're going to try to use that enforcement mechanism like we have on vast trails on the VASA trails. Um, our website is down. You may have seen that. Uh, we've had a contractual issue with our host hosting service. And that ended up getting pulled uh, sooner than we hoped and expected. We have a, you know, a skeleton website up right now, and we're working with a vendor to get to get a new a new site up. But uh, in the meantime, uh, people can contact us if they want things that have been up on that, and uh, hopefully it won't be too big an inconvenience for people. You can still get to the board section. You can still get through to the licensing uh, section. So and the regulations. So hopefully that'll answer most people's questions. But. Uh, working on that. Uh, we're meeting, uh, uh, department staff are meeting with Windsor right now, uh, tonight on on use of, of our land down there and uh, and uh, and the, the, the varied interests and uses that, that folks want that new wildlife management area to, to go to. Our intention is to keep it, uh, all of the historic uses on there that we can. We may adjust some of them, but it's going to be a different, it's going to be an unusual WMA for us and that we're going to have you know, horseback riding and picnicking and whatever else, uh, provided it doesn't interfere with the priority uses on that. So, for instance, we might have allow mountain bikers except during the peak hunting season, something like that. Um, that's our intent there. Uh, deer survival seems good so far. Um, we uh, are in the midst of submitting a, a large grant to uh, for wetland acquisition to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and this summer, we're uh, planning on uh, on having a couple of projects we're really excited about. We're going to take some habitat stamp money. We're going to work with the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, and I hope with Audubon to raise money for that habitat stamp through their membership and through their efforts. And then we're going to turn around and use that money to do projects in conjunction with them. So we'll hire Vermont Youth Conservation Corps crews to work on some WMAs. I hope that we will have as part of that project uh, work weekends where volunteers, if they're interested in a WMA, can come and do some work on it with the VYCC crew. That gets around that old problem we have of we go to do a work project and we've got four staff working on a weekend and three volunteers show up. Uh, if that happens in this case, fine, the VYCC crew will still do their work. But if 15 volunteers show up, there'll be people to help them uh, work on the WMAs. Um, and this Saturday, uh, Turkey Federation folks are working on habitat on the main belt of WMA, so we're excited about that. I think that's it. Did I miss anything, Mark? Good. All right. Cool. Round table, Dave? Not much. I was fortunate to take a pretty nice uh, lake trail. It was, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. It had uh, some pretty neat uh, claw marks down its head. I don't know if it had survived a uh, osprey or something like that effect. The alternative of uh, theory is that it survived memory for those that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's, that's, that's good. How big were those? Those are nice. Huh? Yeah, the biggest, the, big, the older one is uh, it was 34 inches. Yeah. Um, the, Did you say, um, promise you wouldn't say where you caught that? Yeah, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the next one was around 29 inches, and then uh, we, got a, we caught a, me and the friend, we also caught a nice, beautiful uh, landlocked salmon, too. So, it's really nice. Awesome. 
The coyote contest thing? Yeah. I got it in a text tonight. It, it passed. Yeah, it did. It passed uh, for uh, second reading, so preliminary yeah. approval. Yeah. And there was a pretty close vote on whether to pull it out of the big game section or not. Yeah. Um, could you ask your turkey biologist to get back to me and tell me what the count is on wildlife management area C? In a. Yep. We did. I didn't see my mouth move, did you? Yep. <laughs> We did ask. Yeah. Yeah. So A two. Uh, that's it. Okay. A all please. I think it's evaluations on my desk. <coughs> Give it to me. Um, Tom Mason. Tom is a interesting individual. If anybody has met, met him, um, but he has a petition here that he filed. Um, I guess Eric doesn't believe it's a petition, but it's to change the, the regulations on the Lamoille River around 10 bends all the way down to the railroad bridge. Yeah, I don't know why you say Eric doesn't think it's a petition. Uh, we acknowledged receipt of it. Yeah, because that's what he put into his email back to me. I don't think it's a petition. Oh. No. Okay. <laughs> that's all I got. So that might be something we need to put in the schedule. Just okay talk about it. And uh, the only other thing is I've got this little piece of paperwork I want to give to you so I give to Kim. Give it to Will, that way I might not lose it. Okay. <laughs> it's a uh, mandatory fur count from New Hampshire. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Your turn. I wanted to comment on that petition on the Ten Bends section of the Moyle River in the Hyde Park Johnson area. I looked down through that petition and one thing that was refreshing about it, instead of being a cut and paste and people from Australia, California, and uh, Austria and so forth on there, uh, it looked like it was predominantly uh, people from Lamoille and Caledonia County that live, work, and recreate in the Lamoille River watershed. And um, it was refreshing to see that, I guess, for me. Uh, the only other comment I have is I believe this is my last board meeting, so I'm take this opportunity to say goodbye to everybody, and I'll miss you. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to serve on this board, and I sincerely will miss it. But when I look around the room, I feel that our natural resources are in very good hands. But Thank you. Been a pleasure. <laughs> so I have an update on Route 78. It's closed. <laughs> in case anybody's going that way. <laughs> So uh, Lewis kind of alluded to it in his commissioner's report about the coyote, comp uh, coyote uh, competition, and uh, I don't. What I call them is the I don't like it crew, and I just feel like this board is going to be starting to get inundated with this I don't like it crew, so it should stop. The I don't like it crew goes out and recruits other people that they talk into not liking it, so they may have more people that don't like it to try to stop that. And that, this is what this board is going to be up against for the coming months and years. So I just feel like I need to say that and be prepared for it. That's all I have. Tom Rogers, are you coming down my way on Wednesday? It's Wednesday, sorry. Down at Dumberston. Yes. Senator, yeah. Yeah. Give it time and while that's been changing climate. Great. Yep. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talking about, you yeah. know, attending. So yeah. that'll be yeah, fun. It seems I'll like the series has had a lot of attendance previously. Yeah. It's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nolan, thank you for all you've done for us, for this board, for the state of Vermont. Fish and Wildlife. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Go to this Craig and Craig, <laughs> working with both of you, it sounds like a law firm. 
I'm going to miss stopping and having maple creamies on our way to the board room. <laughs> but. And they'll still come down for the creamy. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, I've learned a lot from you, Craig, on our, we always ride together, and it, I think that um, there's, a, there's a big learning curve when you get on the board, and it's really nice to be able to have history and kind of understand what's going on because it's, it almost takes six years to grasp it all when <laughs> you're done. So I'll, I'll certainly miss you. Thank you for all your guidance. And the turkey population is healthy. They're doing well. Thanks for feeding them. <laughs> Greg, it's been nice getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you. You summed it up well. It's, it feels like a privilege to serve on this board, and I think you've done a fine job. That's it. Craig, thanks. I'll come visit when I go up to visit Please April's Maple for the Creamies and go up right. to Jackson's and yep. Sounds good. play on the power lines and everything else. But we'll stop by for sure. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I got a phone call about um, game suppers around the Chittenden County area. And um, there was a church that had game suppers for years, and this was the first year they didn't have it because they were having trouble finding donations of wild game. So um, this person was wor um, curious, and it got me kind of curious, is or are game suppers something that are on a, a downward trend statewide, or is it something more in the Chittenden County area because there's bigger events holding bigger game suppers, or? I don't think so. Uh, I'd be surprised if they reached out to us and we didn't get them something. Um, we're usually, I don't, I don't want to say our record's perfect, but it's usually pretty good if they reach out to their warden. Yep. Um, I don't know if they did that or not. And maybe it was like a, because I know there's a lot of warden turnover in that area the past couple of years, so I mean, maybe it was just a function of lost contacts. Yep. Okay. Um, that would be it. I believe, <laughs> for now. <laughs> uh, I want to say thanks, Craig. It's been an absolute pleasure. Your insight to the Northeast Kingdom has, has been a pleasure, and your connection with everybody up there has been invaluable. Thank you. So I'm going to absolutely miss you. Uh, I do want to give some kudos to the Hunter Ed Department and Fish and Wildlife for skinny pancake. I think uh, they're at the Yankee Classic. I think that was a, a great thing. I think a lot of people had a chance to eat venison crepes up there. So uh, it, it was, I had a lot of people come by the booth and say that it was delicious and, and really liked it. So it's a great way to fun. interact the, the seminars and all that with actually utilizing it and eating it. So I just want to say that, uh, please continue to do more of those. Uh, Brad and I did a uh, deer processing seminar on Saturday and Sunday. We had uh, about 80 or 85 people wow. on Saturday. Wow. Uh, we are going down to the big room next year if we have to do it because we're not going to be upstairs in the closet doing it. <laughs> uh, I've already told them that. So, uh, I, I hadn't asked the commissioner period there, and the only tough question I got was from Justin Lindholm. <laughs> I was expecting some real fireworks. <laughs> I want to have the, make sure the department continues those outreach education uh, programs that they've been doing. So I think it's it's really good. Um, I'd like the climate talk not to be on a bait fish rule meeting. So maybe next time we can not have it coincide with another department hearing because we've had those a couple of times and oh, yeah. quite a few people have been having to miss out on some. We've got a few more of those scheduled. It seems like every time I schedule one, three more boards or conservation commissions call me up and ask for another one. Right. So we'll, we'll get to the one soon. Right, so make sure we kind of keep an eye on this. We don't have some things overlapping so the rest of us can attend them too. So again, uh, right, pleasure, and that's it for me. I have one more thing to add. No, I don't I think think so. only, <laughs> so. I think there's only one other board member here that was on the board and Craig and I came in 
and there is already another Craig on the board. What are the odds that <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 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 14 boards? Right. That's great. Yeah, because there was really three weird. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, guys. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All right. Thank you.